Hello and welcome. Carrie here from Healing Humanity, the power of a proper human diet, along with uh, Dr. Anthony Chafee. How's it going, Dr. Chafee? How's it going? Very well. Thank you. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. I am I'm thankful, grateful, blessed to have you here on the channel with me. i um, been looking forward to talking to you some more. Uh, I think this video is going to be a fun one. So it's called the Top 10 Carnivore Superpowers. And mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know. I've, I've been doing carnivore for over 300 days now, and that's the best way I can describe it. I've heard other people describe it. I feel sort of superhuman. I feel much better than I have my entire life. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess one of the interesting things is you out of everyone, I feel like is kind of superhuman. I, I'm so fortunate <laughs> to have done a couple of videos with you, but uh, and this isn't flattery, like trying to uh, flatter uh, Dr. Chafee here. I mean, your schedule is insane you do neurosurgery and you're uh helping millions of people online with your podcast and your youtube channel and like, do you do you sleep at all like how does that work <laughs> uh not as much as i'd like you know some, <laughs> sometimes it's pretty late days so you know this whole last week i've been uh you know, working from about 5 30 in the morning until about 11 o'clock at night and then uh, i've actually made it a point to start going to the gym again. So I've been back in the gym last, last couple of weeks. So I'm just sort of getting done at like, you know, 12 30, one o'clock. And then I'm, I'm doing things for, you know, the YouTube stuff, answering messages, scheduling things and things like that. And then back up again in a few hours. So it's been a bit, it's been a bit uh, rough this last couple of weeks, but uh, it's, it's manageable anyway. Right. Yeah. Carnivores don't need to sleep anyway. <laughs> We uh, do. It's nice, but, you know, we can handle nice. it if we don't, if we can't. Right. Uh, speaking of superhuman people, uh, I'm really thankful, Dr. Chafe, you did a video with me and my friend, Jeff DeProsperous. Uh, mm -hmm. Jeff is like, I've met so many people on my carnivore journey, and Jeff is one of them that's been incredible. Uh, he's uh, battling stage four cancer. He's on a journey to be cancer free. But talk about like superhuman feats. I went to visit him and film him for our documentary uh, for a week. I could barely keep up with him. And that's after he's going through chemo treatments and he doesn't eat for five days in a row. And he's going to the gym. He's taking his kids to all these events. Like he was nonstop the entire time. I'm like something he said to me when I interviewed him, he's like, I feel superhuman. He's like, I feel like I'm 20 and I'm twice. I'm, I'm he's 43. He just did chemo two days ago, and he literally feels better than he has his entire life. So mm -hmm. there's something to this. I hear so many people saying, I just, I feel superhuman as a carnivore. So I thought it'd be fun, have a little fun with Dr. Chafee, but to talk about some of these different things that I've noticed for myself and that other carnivores have told me have happened uh, as a result of carnivore, and then maybe talk a little bit about like, why, what is the mechanism? What is the science behind mm -hmm. some of these uh, so if that works for everyone and, and if anyone's watching from my channel, obviously everyone knows who Dr. Chafee is, but if you're not subscribed, uh, I have a link in the description below and you should absolutely go subscribe. I think it's so important. I, I never would have started carnivore if it wasn't for good doctors like Dr. Chafee getting the truth out there and getting the word out there. And it's really important that we elevate the voices of Dr. Chafee. Uh, I did a video a while back about positive deviance. When you hear deviant, it sounds like a mm -hmm. bad thing, but Dr. Chafee, you are a positive deviant. The social norm <laughs> is everyone's out there in the standard American diet, junk food, eating sugar, cancer rates going through the roof, diabetes is horrible, 70% of America is obese. That's the social norm, and the only way we break that is with these positive deviants, people that are doing something drastically different but having absolutely amazing results. We need to, we need to elevate those voices more, so... I'm I'm really thankful and grateful for your time doing this. So maybe uh, should we just jump right into it? Yeah, sounds good. All right, I've, this one we've got all sorts of different ones, and for everyone in the chat, please uh, please post your own if you've experienced something that seems uh, supersedes what the normal human <laughs> ability is. I'll post it in the sidebar. So I, we, I wrote some of these. I have them here on the screen, so they're a little bit kind of funny, but. Sunburn mm -hmm. immunity. Now, this one sounds kind of crazy, Dr. Chafee, but I experienced this myself uh, as a carnivore. Um, I roofed our movie theater with an Amish friend of mine. Just real weird situation there, but <laughs> 14 hours I was out in the sun and I'm like, I'm, I didn't wear any suntan lotion. I'm like, I'm going to be baked. I'm going to be fried. And the next day, my Amish buddy was baked and fried and sunburned. And I was perfectly fine. And then I started noticing this and I started talking about it online. It seems to really fire people up online because I had a couple hundred people on one post where like 50% of them were like, 
I don't get sunburned as a carnivore. I used to burn all the time. I don't get sunburned. And then the other 50% were like, you guys are crazy. It's if you're going to yeah. put a lot of heat out, you're going to burn yourself. So do you have any thoughts on that? Or is there any science behind why wouldn't I, it just seems like I don't get sunburned as a carnivore. So I, th I think there's a few different reasons. One of the, one of the main reasons is you're removing a lot of inflammatory factors and things like that. You know, just the thing that people understand their, their joints start a aching less. They have less back pain. They feel sort of better in a lot of ways. They're getting rid of a lot of these things that can cause inflammation from the food that they're eating, be it plants or artificial sweetener or sugars and ingredients and things like that. Um, and so you're, you're getting rid of that. So you're reducing the amount of inflammation. You're reducing the amount of damage that you can get from different sorts of things like the sun. You get in the sun, you get a bit of sun damage and you have all this inflammation it exacerbates that. Your body can't heal as well from that. And then that redness, which is just blood coming to the surface of the skin to try to heal the area, it's not going to be able to do its job and then it turns into peeling and damage and it hurts. And so the same reasons that you don't get sore after you work out. And I, I, that, I think that that upsets people the most when I say that. They're like, you get sore. Don't you lie. And it's like, I, I don't. So I can promise you that. And you won't either if you just stop eating plants for two weeks. And so it's the same idea. You're just removing these sorts of factors that can cause it inflammation that increases pain, swelling, stiffness, and so on. And damage. Um, that's sort of a, a, a very vague general sort of statement, but there are specific toxins in plants that make animals photosensitive, light sensitive. And some of them are called foranocoumarins, and these exist in all sorts of different plants. They're in all citrus and in grapefruits, oranges, lemons, limes, things like that. They're also in celery, parsnips, and that those families, and, and many, many, many other sorts of things. So animals see this in animal husbandry. They will get into different forage if they run out of food and they're not really sort of being cared for as well as they could be. Uh, and they might eat plants that they're not supposed to, or maybe they just get into them anyway because they're, they're young and they don't know better. And they get horribly burned in the sun. And uh, th this is just another way that plants defend themselves is by making you more susceptible to your environment such as light sensitivity so it there's actually a name for it in medicine that almost no one knows about but it's called phytophotodermatitis phyto from, coming from plants photo from uh light dermatitis damage to the skin so this is an actual medical diagnosis that actual dermatologists actually diagnose people with and you know when you talk about this oh that's not a real thing i this is an actual medical term people can look it up phytophotodermatitis p-h-y-t-o photodermatitis so that's another reason you're getting rid of these sorts of things that will do make make you directly sensitive to the sun another reason is that vitamin d is actually a, a, one of the original ways that that uh, we protected ourselves from uv light not just us i mean this is this was back in the genetic past, you know, millions and millions and millions of years ago and hundreds of millions of years ago, potentially. And so when you are on a carnivore diet, you make vitamin D more, more abundantly and more easily because you're not putting in all these plant sterols. You actually have cholesterol. Vitamin D is made from cholesterol. And if you don't have enough cholesterol, if you don't make enough cholesterol, if your cholesterol is being interrupted, then that will not only screw around with your ability to make vitamin D, but all your hormones, nearly every single hormone in your body is, is derived from cholesterol. So like testosterone, estrogens, progestogens, mineralocorticoids, glucocorticoids, uh, you know, like, like cortisol, these sorts of things, all of these things are derived from from uh, cholesterol and there's about a number of different steps between cholesterol and testosterone and then estrogen every single one of those is is a unique hormone that has a unique individual purpose in your body every single one is derived from cholesterol things like dhea androstein progesterone or pregnenolone things like that so same goes for vitamin D. So if you don't have enough cholesterol, you're not going to be able to make vitamin D properly. And why would a non-carnivore not have enough vitamin D? Well, you could be taking something that interrupts your body's ability to make vitamin D, but really what you're doing is you're taking in plants that have plant sterols, which is the plant version of cholesterol. And it's similar enough to our cholesterol that it mimics that and our body sort of sees that and says, okay, we don't need as much of this. 
And so it doesn't produce as much. But that those plant sterols can't be used to make hormones. They can't be used to make vitamin D. And they go into our cell membranes. Our cell membranes are made out of cholesterol nearly entirely. And then you have plant sterols getting stuck in there. We get rigid, stiff, crummy cell membranes. But you can't make vitamin D properly from this. You can't make hormones properly from this. So your hormones suffer. And vitamin D is a hormone. It's a very important hormone, but it is also a sun protectant. And so if you have a bunch of plant sterols in your body, even if you're using coconut oil and things like that, which is far and away better than any seed oil or vegetable oil or anything like that. Absolutely. But it does have plant sterols in it and that can interrupt your, your cholesterol metabolism. And then you're not going to make vitamin D properly. That goes on the surface of your skin. It's mostly, well, it's largely made on the surface of your skin. Vitamin D is as a, as a UV protectant. And then over the course of hours and possibly up to 48 hours slowly soaks into your skin. People don't know that either. You can't just go in the sun and then go take a shower and be good. You actually have to give it hours and hours and hours to soak back into your skin. There was a study in 1927 where they actually took the sebum, which is the oils off of the skin of people that had been in the sun and gave it to mice who were suffering from rickets, which, which is a, a vitamin D deficiency, gave them the sebum from these people who've just been in the sun and it cured their rickets. Right. So they they concluded that, like, hey, you know, a lot of your vitamin D is, is actually on the surface of your skin, not inside your skin. Some of it is inside your skin, but a good proportion of it's on the surface of your skin. And if you wash with soap and water, you're going to wash that off. So those I think those are my top three reasons why uh, we don't burn. Um, also, the, you know, just as a side note, you know, it doesn't apply just to carnivores. But if you wear sunglasses, probably not the best idea because for at least for this reasons anyway if you wear sunglasses that don't have uv protection it's not good for your eyes because it, you're not getting as much visible light so your pupils are dilating up it thinks it's dark but more uv light is actually penetrating through and can damage your retina if you do have uv light it actually blocks that off and so your brain doesn't even realize you're in the sun and that can actually um reduce your body's ability to make uh, melanocytes increase you know melanin vitamin d and things like that so you can actually burn worse if you're wearing UV blocking sunglasses as well. Wow. Great answer. Knocked it out of the park. I, it's mm -hmm. so interesting how us big brained humans, we mess things up because it, it's really crazy now in retrospect, when you think about it, that we go out into nature, like to the beach and then we lather suntan lotion on to hide from the sun and we do that all day and then we come home and we take a shower and then we sit under fluorescent lights uh until all hours of the night it's like completely backwards from what i guess natural would be yeah well i i see people all the time like here in australia and elsewhere where they're just they're just tr they're going out to the beach and they're doing everything they can to just not be at the beach you know they're right. that you know like to, you know tarps and tents so they're covering themselves up they're slathering themselves with uh, very carcinogenic chemicals uh, in the sunblock and benzene, things like that are, are normal ingredient in a lot of these things. Vitamin E, I was taught by my professor of dermatology in medical school, uh, you know, didn't show us any studies, but this is just what, what she taught me was, or us was that you never put anything on your skin that has vitamin E before you go in the sun because the UV light can actually mutate it and change it into another actually very harmful chemical that's very bad for your skin and mutagenic and carcinogenic. And she was saying at the time that it was, um, I think it was something like a, a, I can't remember if it was seven or 20 fold in, times increase risk in developing skin cancer if you use something with vitamin E on your skin before you went in the sun. Like after the sun, great before the sun, not so great. And so either way, whether it's seven or 20, it's a, it's a large multiplication in your risk of, of developing skin cancer. And a lot of these sunblocks and things like that, because every, because people know from a marketing perspective that people latch on that vitamin, who has vitamin E, vitamin E is good for my skin. This is good for my skin. I'm going to put this on my skin. And it's not so good for your skin if you go in the sun with it. Mm, good to know. Yeah, I actually, in my 20s, uh, I was diagnosed with squamous cell cancer on my ear. Oh, wow. And in those days, I was always lathering on the suntan lotion, putting everything mm -hmm. on. But I, I really wasn't even in the sun that much. And I was young and um, it's probably due to chronic inflammation or something else. But uh, all right, here's another one. I I'm interested to get your take on this because I've heard you talk about some giants throughout history. Uh, my friend Jeff DeProsperous again, his son, Peter, 15-year-old uh, carnivore, 
he's uh, I think he's like six foot. He's just killing it on the, the soccer mm-hmm. field. And I Jeff's like, he's still growing and growing. So mm-hmm. uh, in terms of carnivore superpowers, giants of history through history, carnivores have stood tall and formidable, dwarfing the average modern man. Um, do you have any examples for this yeah. and why? I've, I've heard you talk about some in the past. Well, plenty of examples. So, you know, even just, just immediately before the agricultural revolution or actually before agriculture at any location on earth, the people there directly before, before agriculture were far taller, four to five inches taller than they were directly after agriculture. So this didn't take hundreds of years. It wasn't thousands of years. It was immediately afterwards. And I have on my Instagram page pinned at the top uh, an actual photograph of a page taken out of a of a you know paleoanthropology archaeology book from um cambridge university where they show this they show two skeletons side by side and and you know one is is four to five inches shorter than the other they talk about how the jaws are smaller more crooked teeth after um after the agriculture after agriculture and all these different signs of poor wound healing poor development and poor health and they said that that you know starting about 10,000 years ago that everywhere that switched over to agriculture regardless of the location regardless of the type of crop the same things happen the height and the health of the people declined and they attributed this to nutritional deficiencies and uh, and they had much higher si- uh, signs of um, you know infection and things like that like tuberculosis so prior to agriculture people were much taller and then you have to understand too that the people that switched to agriculture from a sort of a hunter-gatherer past they're the ones that sort of used more plants so they were actually hunter-gatherers and then they started realizing hey we don't have to gather these things we can just put some of the stuff in the ground and it grows great let's start doing that so someone figured that out it's quite clever actually and then they started you know switching over to much more plants but by virtue of the fact that they even knew to use plants in any sort of abundance in the first place, they were clearly using them before. So these people weren't exactly as tall as they could have been. Now you go back. So in in that textbook, it says the average height was uh, five foot nine. And then directly after that was five foot five, some you know shorter than that. So you look back before that, you look back before the die off of the megafauna, the mammoth and giant sloths and all these other sorts of things that died off around 15 12 to 15,000 years ago and people were much taller so the areas that were just hunting mammoths or the great mammoth hunters during the ice ages for example and they were they had nothing else to eat besides mammoths there weren't any options besides mammoth they probably didn't care if there were options besides mammoth you take down a mammoth that's that's all you have to eat for the next few years is is that mammoth but they were much taller than that. So depending on the area, they could be on average anywhere from five foot adult male height, anywhere from five foot 10 up to six foot two on average. And in some areas they found up to six foot four on average, right? So it's far, far, far higher than we are now. I believe last time I sort of looked at it, I forget exactly what year, anyway, in recent, recent times in America, I think the uh, adult male height was five foot eight. China is five foot six, Mongolia is five foot four. And as I understand it, during Genghis Khan's reign, the Mongol horde, they were just eating horse meat, drinking horse blood, had some fermented milk products. And so you know, they're very lactose intolerant. And there's no carbs, it's just a bit of you know, yogurt and things like that. And uh, and they, say they make a sort of a vodka out of the milk as well, which just sounds ghastly, but I, I think <laughs> I'd have to try it, even though I don't really drink. You know, just if I was ever over there, I would think I'd have to. And um, and they again were were on average like six foot four. So the you know that's what we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be much taller than we are, and uh, we are shrinking as a result of of poor development, of misdevelopment. Our children, us as children, did not get our proper nutrition, and that curtailed our development and our growth and our brain. The average brain size and the adult male brain size reduced by 11% immediately after the advent of agriculture and it's persisted till today. And so again, overnight, this did not take hundreds or thousands of years. This took, this was just immediate 11% reduction in brain capacity in men, in women, 17%. So actually is, is a higher uh, percentage reduction in, in cranial capacity pre and post agriculture. So 
you know, this is a dramatic difference in our development. Then you look at the Native Americans in North America and the Plains Indians in particular, who were just eating bison at 100 million plus bison available roaming around the Great Plains, actually making the Great Plains as verdant and, and, uh, and, and rich as it was. And that had to do with the animals. You know, they, they were part of the land and the great grass plains of the world developed with these big ruminants and they, and they both fostered and supported each other. And so you had over a hundred million buffalo, bison, American buffalo going through there. And so they had this endless supply of, of bison to eat. And there was a study in 2001 that, that looked at various different sources and showed that the Plains Indians in America eating only bison in the 1800s were the tallest population of humans on earth. So some people said uh, even taller than the Dutch. Yes, even taller than the Dutch, the tallest human beings on earth. And that, I mean, that is not this, the case anymore, is it? So, you know, while some populations have had eight to 10,000 years to adapt ish to have the, have at least some adaptive process and time uh, to adapt to agricultural food. The native Americans have had a hundred years, essentially, you know, especially some of them. And so that's no time at all. And so now they're four times as likely have, have a much higher rate of disease, chronic disease, obesity, cancer, diabetes, autoimmunity, and so on. And they are not the tallest population of human beings on earth. I don't know where they stack at the moment, but they are certainly not the tallest population. And then you look at the native Australians who, again, like the native Americans, especially the Plains Indians, were carnivores up until a blink of an eye in, in geological terms, really about a hundred years or so. Obviously different people at different times would be more incorporated into Western society more or less quickly. But in you know the 1800s, early 1900s, there was a big push to Westernize the, the uh, native Australian people by the British. And one of the things that I read about was a battle in Western Australia, sort of in the northern portion of that that state that I'm in. And it was it was a big battle between the British and the Aboriginals. I'm sure they were very much outmatched from from a weaponry standpoint. So it was a bit of a slaughter on uh, the side of the of the uh, you know the, the receiving end being the the native Australians, the Aboriginals. And there were reports that I read of the British coming back to the the battlefield, you know, like a year or two later. It's just you know skeletons everywhere just bones everywhere and they found that the forearm so the radius and ulna just your just your forearm there that the forearm of many of these uh skeletons of the ab aboriginals was longer than the british soldiers completely outstretched arm mm. just their forearm was longer than their entire arm so these were giants they're absolutely massive monsters they're not anymore you know they're much shorter than this on average. So the average height of a population denotes the average health of a population. And everywhere you see these different populations that are only eating meat, and then directly after they're eating meat, they shrink and they get the height and the health of every population goes down, right? So in that textbook at Cambridge, they say that everywhere you look at any time and any place and any crop, any, any, you know, plant-based, you know, sort of nutrition that they switch to, or at least include more of, the height and the health of the people decline. And we saw this in real time. We're seeing it in real time right now with the Native Americans and Native Australians being prime examples. Hmm. Awesome. It's interesting to think of the next generation of kids if they all just ate the proper human diet what what would what would happen downstream from there be a crazy world absolutely here's a kind of a fun one uh supernatural senses carnivores experience a heightened <laughs> awakening of their five senses akin to superhuman perception um i've heard many <laughs> reports of this i know we joke a little bit but like for myself um well i dr jordan peterson famously talked about lion diet on joe rogan and he said floaters in his eyes cleared up i've had a bunch of people mm -hmm. on my channel say that their vision has improved um for me it's like uh my sense of hearing and um smell seem to improve i don't know during the 2020 all that fun that went on i kind of lost my sense of smell it came back when i was eating the proper human diet and uh 
it seems like yeah like i'm listening to music or something now it's like i can hear the guitar i can hear uh the drums i can hear everything i don't know if it's just because I don't have that brain fog anymore but um yeah. is there any sort of science behind that i've heard several people report that their senses seem a lot better uh eating the proper human diet well, I mean, a lot of your, your senses can be more refined. And certainly if, if, if you think about taste, a lot of people have a much more refined sense of taste. And that could just be that their, their palate is, is becoming more refined and, and, and sensitive to the nutrients that are actually good for them. Yeah, I, my sense of sweetness is very heightened. So if I have a glass of milk, it's, it just tastes like ice cream. It tastes like I'm just drinking liquid ice cream. And, um, you know, that's why I, I tend to avoid milk because I'm like, I'm going to want to drink more of that because it tastes like ice cream and it's, and it's delicious. But others that, that then go back and maybe have their, like their favorite treat or their favorite cookie. Like I've, I've never done this because I don't care to, but they say that they go back to that and it, it doesn't taste good. It, it sort of tastes gross and it's just way too sweet. And it's just it's an offensive taste because you know, their, their tastes have changed. And some people, oh, I just, I don't like meat and I need all these spices on it. It's like, well, maybe for now, but your taste taste will, will change. I always tell people that. And over the course of a few weeks, you just start really appreciating just the taste of meat itself and with or without salt, whatever your preference is. And it's, it, it's a much more heightened sense in that regard. So there's something, there's something changing there. And certainly eyesight improves in a lot of people. I have had Time and time and time and time again, people message me or comment in in my lives or in my comment section that they're that they don't need glasses anymore. They go to their ophthalmologist, and their their prescription improves, and it's 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 absolutely amazing. There's um there there, and and then things like macular degeneration. I mean, there's a number of ophthalmologists in the sort of keto carnivore space. They're saying you you can just reverse this. Uh, you know, mac macular degeneration is one is is I think the leading cause of uh, of you know blindness of, of non-congenital blindness right so you know this is a major 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 issue and your your diet and lifestyle can absolutely play a factor and completely reverse that or prevent that um there's a, a doctor um we mean if i'm not mispronouncing her name she's she's an ophthalmologist she talks about this and how this is, is that you, you actually can reverse a lot of uh, vision issues and improve your vision, come off glasses or improve your prescription and even improve uh, cataracts and things like that. Cataracts can be caused from glycation. You know, all the different damage to your body that high levels of blood sugar cause can also damage, well, can damage your retina, but it can also damage your, your lens. And fructose specifically is much more uh, uh, glycative than, than even glucose is, especially to your to your lens and that can cause opacification which we call cataracts and generally have to remove that and so this is this is something that people are seeing um i i, I don't know about the hearing i think i'm still pretty you know half deaf <laughs> like that's what i when i'm operating with people i just like i'm just like can you speak the f up i cannot <laughs> hear you you know so um but um I've certainly noticed it in my taste for myself, and and I can I cannot tell you how many people have told me that they've improved their their vision and even stopped having to use glasses. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. Okay. Here's a, here's another fun one. Uh, epic longevity. Carnivores seem to unlock an ancient secret to extraordinary lifespan. Uh, I got to thank Dr. Chafee for introducing me to our sh our our good friend uh, Maggie, who we went and filmed for the documentary. Yeah. She's a she's a prime example um, of this. But uh, so I know like Maggie's putting the proper fuel in her body for sixty plus years now, so she's not getting ill or sickness. So for that reason, but what other science or what is behind living longer? I've heard you talk about this a little bit more uh, in detail before, so I wanted to dig into it a little bit. Well, I mean, it simply comes down to, you know, if you're eating what you're designed to eat, you should live out the normal course of your lifespan unless something poisons you or kills you or, or, or shortens your life in some other way. So if you are eating outside of that, that could potentially not provide the, the essential nutrients that you need or the, enough of them and could 
obviously be harmful to you, which is the entire reason that I stopped eating plants and that everyone else should stop eating plants if they care about their health or, you know, really want to optimize their health because these things do have toxins. They have things that are objectively harmful to you, even just carbohydrates. They fundamentally rearrange and change your entire metabolism biochemistry. That, that is a massive, massive, massive detriment. It's a massive change. So, I mean, you're really, really hurting your body by putting this stuff in your, in, in your body. As Dr. Gary Fetke says, there, you have about four grams of carbohydrates in your body. Even going up one gram up to five grams is a toxic load of glucose and your body responds to it as a toxin by trying to detoxify it by raising your insulin. And it's so important to get that below four grams that it raises insulin, which completely rearranges your entire metabolic structure. And it causes all these problems down the road as well. So it's vitally important to keep that below that toxic load. And when people have diabetes, it's basically decompensated uh, ability to to lower the blood sugar. They start getting above that four gram mark and that starts killing them. And this is why diabetics start needing foot amputations. They start losing their kidneys. They get to develop heart disease and Alzheimer's and all sorts of other sorts of illnesses and then they die, right? It's very, very serious. Just one gram, one extra gram of glucose. And this does all this damage to your body. And so you can do things to damage yourself. And eating carbohydrates is one of them, but it's not the only one. Plants make over, you know, around a million different defense chemicals to stop and deter animals from eating them. So you're putting these things in your body and you're just harming yourself. It's, it's plain and simple. And so we look at this from a genetic perspective. We know as geneticists that based on the length of our telomeres, we should live on average of 120 years. That's what I was taught in genetics. And I've, I've seen this multiple times since then. And so the telomeres are sort of like a molecule sort of chain on the end of your chromosomes. And we sort of look at this and they sort of they just sort of start popping off. And when they run out, that's it for that cell line and it sort of dies off. Now you can do things to lengthen your telomeres and shorten the telomeres and all these sorts of things. That's why these, these anti-aging doctors and and scientists and researchers such as uh, you know, David Sinclair, they're trying to do things all this lengthens your telomeres. Uh, interestingly enough, cancers have capped telomeres, so they never run out of, t uh, of telomeres. And that's where they can just propagate and go and go and go. So do lobsters. So lobsters, you know, Jordan Peters fav Peterson's favorite animal, they have just capped telomeres. And so they, they can just really go and go and go, basically live indefinitely in unless they're killed by something. And so that was always what I thought when I was a kid was just, you know, if, you, if you're looking for the fountain of youth, why don't you figure out how to cap our, our telomeres and see what happens there? Probably we're going to get a whole bunch of weird cancers that you don't want, but it's a thought. And based on our telomeres, you know, we should live, be living about 120 years. Okay, so why are we dying in our 60s and 70s? Why is the average life expectancy from birth in most developed countries in the 70s? And um, that, you know, it's 50 years early. That's 40, 50 years early. So something's harming us. Something's killing us slowly but surely and building up over time you know this is you know, people smoke they on average depending on how heavy they smoke they reduce their life expectancy by you know say 20 years if you're a heavy smoker why is that are you just perfectly healthy and then one day you just drop dead no you're you're damaging yourself and you're building up a, a massive body of inflammation and toxic exposure and you're getting sicker and sicker and sicker and sicker and sicker until you just you just you can't keep on going anymore. So if you don't do that and you eliminate all these sorts of things, you should just, you should just make it long. We should be making it to 120. You know, what does it mean to uh, on average have a life average life expectancy or genetically we should have a, a life expectancy of 120 years. That means that if you just stay out of your own way and don't mess up and don't get killed by something and don't poison yourself, that you should make it to 120 without doing anything special, not listening to any of the gurus, not taking metformin or all the different sorts of you know anti-aging drugs and these sorts of things that Dr. Sinclair does. Just being alive, just doing your normal human thing, if you are actually doing your normal human thing, you should make it to 120 years without doing anything special. And yet we're dying 50 years earlier than that. We're calling that a good life. Saying someone who dies in their, at, at 82, wow, they, they had a really good life. Oh, 90, wow, that's amazing. 100, that's amazing. They died 20 years early. 
or 30 years earlier, 40 years early, right? So that's that's not that's res in respect to everyone else living. They did they had a good time, but in proportion of what we're supposed to live, what we're designed to live, we're dying young. So something is killing us, right? And so I think you have a lot of ground to make up before you ever start looking at the metformin or the rapamycin or all that sort of stuff. You know, you just just eat a normal human diet. And you're going to live a normal human lifespan. And, you know, maybe all those things will make you live to be 150. Maybe. I don't know. But um, the thing is, is that you can, you already get about another 40, 50 years just by eating a proper diet. And you'll be much healthier the whole time because that's the whole thing. You die early because your health is damaged and degraded and it builds up over the years and the decades, just like with smoking, just like with drinking, just like with any toxic exposure. And eventually it just kills you. You don't do that. You're not going to get this buildup of toxic exposure, and you're just you're just going to age much more gracefully. And you're not you're not going to have all the pro problems uh, that they that they experience elsewhere. How do we know this? What was the evidence out for this? No one's ever lived that long. Yes, they have. So the Native Americans, again, back in the 1800s, there's there's account after account after account after account that they were living 110, 115, 120, even 130, 137 years in Chief John Smith White Wolf. And of course, we don't have an official government, you know, ID for them and a, and a birth certificate and things like that. This, these are their own accounts and they're talking about these things, but it's consistent. And throughout, you know, everywhere you go, they're just like, yeah, that's, well, that person's 108 and this, that, and the other, and they're doing fine. They're like, really? Yeah, how is that possible? They're just saying that. Well, you know, they may just be saying that, but they're, they're just happening to lie and say that they live the exact life expectancy to the exact age range that we would expect people to live if they were living naturally and 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 just living out to their genetic potential so it's very very strange that i mean they're not it's not like you know they're talking about like being like you know methuselah and things like that so, oh i'm 982 like okay yeah that's fine they're not they're saying 110 130 120 right that's right in that range that we know as geneticists you're supposed to live so that's very normal they should be living that long. And so we should be living that long as well. So Chief John Smith White Wolf, you can see many accounts. There's no hard evidence one way or the other. It's his word against against other people who just don't believe it. Right. So you see a number of different blogs. And his he said this, and his family said this, and his, you know, people said this. Um, and he died in the 1920s. And he actually has described on multiple occasions his experiences fighting in the war of 1812 as an adult. Right. So that's 110 years before he was born or sorry, before he died. He's he's talking about he, he, and he's describing what happened in the War of 1812 from his own personal perspective. So, you know, there is some credibility there. And, you know, the same people that believe the the blue zone uh, lies, you know, are the same people going, nah, that's not, that, that's not true. That couldn't possibly be there. There, this was, this was people's own accounts and their own, you know, self-reporting in the blue zones saying that they lived a long time. And so it's exactly the same amount of evidence that chief John Smith, white wolf and his people, uh, provided, right. Which is just their own accounts. So if you accept the blue zone data, if you accept the blue zone thing saying that these are vegetarians, they live, longer than everyone else, which they are not vegetarian. And actually they don't necessarily live uh, all that much longer. Um, then you have to accept, you have to accept the, the native Americans in the, in, in North America, them self-reporting this and the native Australians saying this and the ancient e Ethiopians in Herodotus who were reported to live 120 years or more. There's a meeting between Persia and Ethiopia and the Ethiopian King and they sort of tar started talking the ethiopian king asked the persian delegate say how well, what do your people eat and how long do your people normally live and the persians you know explained growing wheat and making bread from this and they said well we would live normally you know about 70 years kind of similar to us and the ethiopian king said well no wonder you live such short lives if all you eat is dirt because we only eat boiled meat and we only drink the milk of our cattle besides water and we would live 120 years sometimes much longer and there that number is again 120 and so he could have been lying he could have just been trying to you know show a big face to the the persians and yet he picked i guess he randomly picked the exact 
age that we should live to on average. So you see this again and again and again and again in these carnivorous populations. We're seeing people like Maggie, who has been carnivorous most of her life, certainly in her adult life when she moved out, she's like definitely not eating another <laughs> stupid vegetable again. But even before that, she was she was like me and so many other people who just hated vegetables, really didn't want to eat them. And she just had kinder parents than most of us because they didn't force her to eat her vegetables. They said, look, she's, she's skinny, she's healthy, let's just let her do what she wants. And so, and she's, you know, 82, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm sure you notice as well. She does not move like an 82 year old. She's like hopping over fences and just climbing up. Um, you know, climb, I sort of climb up a mast of a of a little you know dinghy sailboat that they have. <laughs> Fast as hell, just grab the line, pull it down. Like, this is this is someone's great grandmother. You know, I mean, this is like it's it's pretty incredible. And so yeah, you just you if you eat what you're supposed to eat. Your body's going to work the way it's supposed to work and you're going to live as long as you're designed to live and we are designed to live at least 120 years if not longer yeah on the maggie front we could talk about maggie all day i can't wait to share some of the footage we got in the documentary from her one of the other things she did dr chafee that was incredible um she got feed and you know like a big five gallon bucket she had four of those completely filled to the top and was carrying four i don't even know if i get four <laughs> five gallon buckets full of feed walking and yeah, when I interviewed her for our documentary, Healing Humanity, I said to her, I was having trouble keeping up by like day five. Like she's just nonstop all day working on a farm. It's a lot of work. I said, Maggie, when are you going to slow down? And she looked in the camera and she said, Carrie, I'm just getting started. And it isn't, <laughs> it isn't a joke or she's like showing off or anything. I believe it. Um, she said to me, I also asked her, like, how long do you think you're going to live to? And she said 120 easily. And I I think she'll go beyond that even at the, the rate she's going Probably. now. It's just just incredible. I, I just want to say one other thing too. You talk a lot about the plant uh, toxins um, and I'm totally on board with all that. I did a video the other day about how I'm never eating plants again my entire life. The plant toxins are one thing that I'm totally on board with, but then it's like I went down this rabbit hole with all of the pesticides and the Roundup mm. and all of those things on it. I saw this video. I got to find it where they, they juiced um, a piece of fruit and then they mm -hmm. analyzed it. It was still full of pesticides. I've always thought that in my head. It was so stupid. Like when I used to eat vegetables and fruit, you take it and you'd sprinkle it underwater in your sink. Like, oh, that's really going to get all the poison that's inside the, mm -hmm. the piece of fruit out. No, it's still in there. We're just telling ourselves, oh, I'm sure it's fine. While we're literally slowly poisoning ourselves. And I just saw this. Uh, uh, I just saw a study that came out. They were talking about if the pesticides and the Roundup uh, weren't bad enough and the roundup they're talking about how it can break the blood brain barrier causes leaky gut it's like everywhere on top of it now they're saying that most pesticides have the forever chemicals in it that stay mm. in your body forever <laughs> like i'm yeah. like i don't need any more reasons like the plant toxins was kind of enough but then when you really think about all those other things I, I, like and what i used to eat dr chafee it would have been like oh, i'm gonna eat a salad like, what is in a salad like 14 calories it, it probably my body my body probably took more energy just to process that than i'm getting out of the 14 calories and then on top of it my body's like what the hell is this there's pesticides in here there's toxins in here there's roundup in here just craziness humans well, just Oh, I was, just, I was just gonna say that, that was actual diet back in the 80s and 90s called the celery diet because they actually calculated out that you would actually your body would actually expend more calories to process the celery and then get the rid of the filthy thing um then then you would actually get from the celery so they said it's like oh you just eat the celery diet. just eat as much celery as you want i mean people are just they, they were really not thinking about this rationally because like there aren't there are not a, a sufficient nutrients in celery. This is not like a mono food that we can just eat like a steak. We just get everything you need. There's all hardly anything favorable in celery. And there's a lot of things that are harmful. But even if we were just looking at this from a nutritional standpoint, you could not just eat celery all the time. You, you get horribly nutritionally deficient and you get very sick and even die. So it's, um, it's just sort of silly when they do that. And it's just all about calories, calories. No, no, it's about nutrients. You know, your body tracks nutrients, not calories. And this is why that sort of the high fiber diet for losing weight was very you know, uh, misguided in the first place because you're, you actually have sensors in your stomach. The idea was is that you ate a whole bunch of fiber and it stretched out your stomach and those stretch receptors released leptin. 
And if they were not stretched, they would release ghrelin. Your brain's, oh, we're empty. We need, we need something in here. Stretch it out. Leptin. Oh, hey, we're fine. Problem is the majority of your leptin is actually created from your, your fat cells. Not all that much come from your stretch receptors, but there is some. But the thing is, is that that's not what your body is looking for. It's not just saying, how much leptin do I have? That's when I stop eating. There are receptors in your stomach that actually look at macro and micronutrients, and that tracks up to the brain, and your brain knows what's in there. So you could eat a whole bag full of styrofoam and just stretch out your stomach, but that's your brain's going to know there's no nutrients in there. That's the same thing that happens when we eat a bunch of vegetables with fiber in it. This is why people going all those high fiber diets, high fiber, low nutrient diets did not really lose weight. They did not get rid of their hunger cravings. They felt bloated and gross and sick and they were still hungry and having cravings. So it really is just not a, a good idea. Right. So if you want to live to 120, like Dr. Chafee said, just get the hell out of the way. Yeah. <laughs> just eat the food you're supposed to eat. It's so funny. You've talked about this before. It's like humans are the only ones with our big brains. We're, we just screw it up so much. Just to just eat what we're supposed to eat. And you, the, the thing too is it's not just living to 120. Right now for the last 300 days I've been doing carnivore, it's been the best I've felt my entire life. So you're like really mm. living uh, versus what I was doing before. I was walking around in a brain fog and fatigue all the time and stomach gurgling and bubbling and actually really living. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, here's, a, here's another one. Superhuman brain power. Uh, the brain, a powerhouse of energy, seems to thrive for most carnivores who often report improved cognition and clarity. What is the reason behind this? Well, there's going to be a lot of reasons why, you know, when the, the, again, going back to the fundamental principles of you're just getting rid of toxins that are harmful to you. And some of those things are harmful to your brain. They're going to cause brain fog. They're going to cause uh, you know, poor you know, physio, they're going to cause physiological stress to your brain as well as the rest of your body. So, you know, just, you just eat this thing, such as affecting your body. You know, last time I checked, the brain is actually part of the body. So, you know, you put these harmful chemicals in your body, it's going to affect your brain and, and nervous system as well. So you're getting rid of these, these things that can negatively affect your brain and your cognition and memory, etc. But a very major uh, side of that coin is that now you're, you're actually providing the proper nutrition to support your brain health as well. So when just being in a state of ketosis, you're having more ketones, provides your brain its optimal energy. The majority of cells in your brain, not all of them, but the majority of your brain prefer ketones and they, and they will run exclusively on ketones if enough ketones are available. So why do I say this? Everybody says that you need to eat glucose and sugar because your brain runs on, on glucose and sugar. Your brain only runs on glucose and sugar if you are not getting enough ketones, right? So that's a secondary fuel source, okay? So why do I say that? Because when you have an abundance of glucose and abundance of ketones, your brain will only run on the ketones, even though there's enough glucose there. So that's a preference. So it only runs on the ketones if there's enough ketones available. But when there's not enough ketones, it will start running on glucose as a secondary fuel source. So that means it's a preference, your brain prefers it. You can also get, you know, insulin resistance, or you know, it's called peripheral insulin resistance. That's a hallmark of type two diabetes. Basically, the the sugar is not getting in into your cells as readily anymore. You need more and more insulin to get the same the same effect, right? And so that is something that can apply to your brain as well. And so over the years and the decades, you're just not getting enough energy into your brain, not getting enough nutrients in your brain, and your brain slowly decays and, and uh, atrophies. Then you switch over to a ketogenic diet. All of a sudden, ketones can cross the blood-brain barrier freely. They don't need insulin. And then phew, your brain wakes up. And so you know, a ketogenic diet, like a carnivore diet, has been shown to be a better treatment in clinical trials in humans, a better treatment for Alzheimer's, people with active Alzheimer's, than every medication ever trial for Alzheimer's. And people like Hal Cranmer are actually reversing people's dementia and Alzheimer's and diabetes and heart, blood pressure issues and all these other sorts of things by putting them on keto carnivore diet. If they can get them on a carnivore diet, he does. If you can just get keto, he does. It's whatever they're able to do. But it's that metabolic state change that can help their brain uh, work much better. The ketones actually cross the blood brain barrier and can reconstitute into uh, fatty acids. And these can actually be used as the physical structures of the brain as well. So in the short term, you're getting better nutrient for your brain. So your brain is turning on 
but it's also long-term helping to rebuild and grow your brain. This is why it's vitally important for kids to be in ketosis. Ch children in the womb are in ketosis. Infants who are breastfeeding, even though there's plenty of lactose in breast milk, they are in a state of ketosis. Kids are much, it's much more easy, it's much easier for them to get into a state of ketosis because they have to be in ketosis because that is how their brain grows. And so we're giving them all this sugary crap. Oh, they like it. They'd like cocaine too. What is wrong with you? Don't give it to them. This is damaging them. And so they give them this sugary stuff, this carb filled stuff because, oh, that's what you're supposed to do. A lot of carbs, a lot of healthy glucose for the brain. No, you need healthy ketones for the brain, especially for young, young children whose brains are developing and growing because a, it's the optimal source. It's the preferred energy source. And, um, secondly, because this, they actually reconstitute into fatty acids and, and can help grow the brain. And then you're also getting all the essential fatty acids that the brain requires. Your brain is made out of, there's a large portion of your brain made out of cholesterol. You have 60 to 70% of your brain of the physical structures of your brain are made out of fat. 20% of your, of your brain is made out of DHA, which is a, a, an omega-3 fatty acid, an essential omega-3 fatty acid that only exists in, in animal fat, does not exist in plants. We don't really make it very well ourselves. We need this from the animal tissue that we eat. And people say, well, there's plenty of omega-3s in plants. Look at flaxseed oil. There's, you know, 30% or so is of their of their flaxseed oil is, is omega-3s, right? That's ALA, not DHA. It doesn't convert into DHA or EPA uh, properly, or even if at all. There's, there's mixed reports on that, but there's plenty of accounts that say it doesn't change at all. And if it does, it's barely any. So it's not enough anyway. And so people say, well, we need omega threes, and and so you know that one's fine. And they lose sight of this because it's a marketing gimmick. They say, oh, healthy omega threes. I need omega threes. That's omega threes. Well, that's like saying we need water. Water's a liquid, so any liquid's fine. Vodka. Let's just drink vodka all the time. No, you need water. That's what you need. And as far as you, you yes, you need an omega three, but you need a specific omega three. You need a couple of specific omega threes: DHA and EPA. And then all the fat soluble vitamins and all these other sorts of things. So you're giving your brain proper nutrition, proper energy metabolism, and you're also relieving all the, the constant pressure and stress of these different toxins that are that are harmful to your brain. So all these things combined, your brain works better, your body works better. Yeah, you mentioned kids. That's one thing that gets me kind of fired up. I, I think hopefully like couple decades from now hopefully sooner we'll look back and be like what the hell were we doing with that you go in the grocery store and all these cereal boxes with cartoon characters on it and getting kids hooked on sugar like a drug mm -hmm. addict from a young age they're lifelong sugar consumers and it's just been completely normalized and it's not normal no. I, I i heard the saying that sugar lights up on an mri just like cocaine or a hard drug does and uh, yeah getting getting kids hooked on it early it's crazy uh yeah it, it, gives, it gives a dopamine response to the addiction center, centers of the brain, like the reward centers of the brain. And uh, it does this to uh, yeah, so just like cocaine, heroin, and meth would. And their MRI studies, you know, Dr. Robert Lustig of UCSF you know, has reported on these and, and written about these, how the fructose specifically is, is what gives this dopamine response. And that on studies with MRIs, they show that sugar addicts and meth addicts they kill the same areas of the brain so the the fructose kills the same areas of the brain as meth to the same extent as meth right so this is this is a horrible drug it also is metabolized in the liver into the same breakdown products as alcohol and this provides the same damage to the liver and the body as alcohol. So fatty liver disease, cirrhosis, diabetes, heart disease, even implicated in cancer, Alzheimer's, and many other diseases. And so it's killing the area, the brain like meth, and it's destroying the body like alcohol. I mean, this is this is one of the worst drugs known to man. It doesn't even, it's not even a good drug. It doesn't even, it's not even fun, you know? <laughs> like, you know, some of these other things would be, I mean, you, you can say what you like, but, you know, just observing people that that are addicted to various drugs, I mean, they're giving up their life. They're living under bridges. They're sharing dirty needles. They're doing things. They're, they're, they're putting themselves under various horrible conditions in order to get, the drug that they're seeking. I mean, you, you don't give up your family and your life and your health for something that's okay. 
pretty good. You, you do that for something that's incredible, and that's that's what you want to revolve your life around, right? So there's 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 a, a lot of, uh, of of reward that they get for that damage to their body to them. Is that are people willing to give up their job and their life and their family and their and their um, their humanity for sugar? Like I, I don't think so. I wouldn't anyway, you know. So like what? But we're doing very similar damage to our body as alcohol and drugs and things like that would. And we're doing this to our kids. We're giving this to children. I mean, at the very least, sugar should be recognized as a drug and, and age restricted. I mean, kids should not be anywhere near this stuff. And so, I honestly think that that the sugar trade now is is the new opium trade. And just people don't realize it. They don't realize just how toxic this stuff is. But people are making vast empires and fortunes backed on the misery and illness of humanity because of sugar. Yeah. Yeah. You go to the grocery store, there's 60,000 products. Almost every one of them has sugar in it. That's one of the toughest right. things, too, because it's become this social norm that, ah, oh, it's just fine. Grandma gives you sugar, birthday cakes on birthdays, and it's just fine. But breaking those social norms is really hard to do for a lot of people because everyone's just like, ah, oh, it's just always, it's always kind of been that way. But I don't know, I mentioned it earlier. Uh, the, the positive deviant thing is when you look around, you see people that who aren't, who's not doing sugar and they, oh, by the way, they're absolutely thriving. Um, you got to elevate yeah. those voices and hopefully at some point that'll break some of those social norms. Cause yeah, it's, it's crazy with kids. Breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Give them sugar in the morning and then they're hooked the rest of the day and the rest of their lives. All right, yeah. we got we got one more here, and then maybe we'll take some uh, questions from the audience. Uh, this one, let's see. Uh, oh, here we go. I've noticed this myself. Endurance of the Titans when working out carnivores display Herculean stamina, seemingly unfazed by fatigue. Mm -hmm. It's like you don't get – I've heard so many people say this on carnivore. I'm running. I'm exercising. I just don't get tired like I used to. Why is that? <sighs> Well, you know, there be many physiological reasons that we, we don't fully understand at the moment. But again, you're getting rid of all these nonsense toxins that are harmful to your body. But being in, being an athlete in a state of ketosis, you are going to constantly regenerate your blood sugar and glycogen to exacting degrees throughout the entirety of your workout. So you're running on your fat stores. You have a, a bottomless pit of energy, right? So, I mean, even, even if someone is very emaciated, you know they're they're still going to have a lot of energy available to them or they or they die right so people that are not emaciated that have a normal body fat percentage even quite a low body fat percentage they have weeks of fat available to them before they even start catabolizing their muscles and breaking those down for energy so they've got a long long way to go before they start hurting themselves and certainly you know working out and 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 pushing themselves hard athletically is no problem there's actually a gentleman that I'll be interviewing for my podcast who ran five marathons in five days without eating the entire time. <laughs> Didn't eat the whole time. Superhuman right? for sure. That's it. And so he's just showing this. It's like, listen, you have plenty of you have plenty of calories. I mean, this is how much calories you burn in a marathon and this is how much you know fat stores you have. And he, you know, he sort of spells it out, you know, on his on his Instagram page. It's like there's more than enough. There's more than enough energy to run five marathons anyway and so you know without eating and certainly without eating carbs you don't need to eat these stupid things they fundamentally disrupt your entire metabolism these things are toxic you know it's so worth it to your body to bring down your glucose level under four grams that it will completely rearrange your entire physiology to do so that's worth it to your body that's how bad this stuff is you know under that certain threshold useful Above that threshold, toxic, right? So, like you know, all my my uh, detractors and colleagues who say that well, plants are all good. Yes, they have all these toxins. First of all, they denied that there were these toxins at all, which is like, well, just read a book on botany and you'll know that that's not true. So they finally heard from people saying like, well, actually, you know, you, you got that one wrong. So they actually had to read a book and they're like, okay, yes, yeah, so there yes, there are all these toxins, but they're good toxins. They're hormetic toxins. They're they're happy toxins. You know, so like, okay, uh, at what level? At what dose? All these sorts of things. Um, well, we do know at least about glucose that it, it is hormetic and, uh, and the line, because that's the important thing about hormesis. You have to know where the line is at this dose. It's beneficial 
past this dose, it's toxic. And you have to know that line because it is toxic after a certain point. And that is the case with glucose. So we know the hormetic line for glucose. Under four grams, positive. Over four grams, toxic. So rearranging your entire physiology is, is a very big deal. And it actually is, is very harmful. And then you start eating carbohydrates, it raises your insulin. You have to eat more carbohydrates and because you're glycogen and your and your blood sugar is just coming down and coming down and coming down mine isn't yours isn't keto athletes aren't because they're in you know they're locked into their fat stores and you have many 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 times more energy available in your fat stores than you could ever store in glycogen in your muscles or liver the maximum amount of glycogen you could stuff into every single cell in your in your body that would take it is does not come close to the amount that you can just store in a small amount of fat. That's why we have fat as our primary energy storage uh, tissue. So people such as Professor um, Tim Noakes in South Africa, who was one of the top exercise physiologists and, and sports medicine doctors for decades, talked about how you need carbs to be a top athlete and all these sorts of things. And that's what he believed. And then he started looking at things and going like, damn it, I got it wrong. And now he's for the last decade or more, he's been trying to uh, you know, undo the the uh, the idea that you have to have carbs, which he helped to promote because that's what he believed at the time. And so now he's doing studies with, with people doing sprinting, doing weightlifting, doing you know, long distance, all these sorts of things, and showing that the ketogenic, they have crossover trials. So they have people on ketogenic diets and normal carb-fueled diets, and they're finding that yeah, you say, like, well, well, you're not going to have the same output. You need carbs to do powerlifting. Nope, you don't. And then you cross over and, and show that the people who are on keto, they start eating carbs. People on carbs, they start doing keto. And then a few weeks later, after they get adapted, they do it again. Absolutely no change in their out outward performance. And then you do the the uh, the long distance things. Oh, well, but you can't do long distance. You need sustained energy of, of glycogen. No, you don't. It's actually the same exact thing that they found is that is that the ketogenic diet people were able to, to, to perform at the same level, but they kept performing. They didn't let down. They were able to replenish their glycogen constantly. You may have one third of the glycogen in your liver if you don't eat carbs as opposed to someone who carb loads. But the person who carb loads, that glycogen level is coming down until it finally hits zero and they hit the wall and they start slowing down. Whereas we never hit the wall because we have one third of the total glycogen, but it never goes down. It stays at that level the whole time because it's constantly being replenished. And um, I, I spoke with a friend of mine, Dr. Paul Mason, who's also a sports medicine doctor and uh, you know friends with Tim Noakes and um, you know, Professor uh, Peter Bruckner and things like that, who are all in this camp and doing a lot of things with top athletes, top sports teams. Oh, well, but no top athletes do this. A lot of top athletes do this. A lot of top rugby players, a lot of top track and field uh, athletes and so on are all doing this and they're having amazing results as, uh, as a consequence. And so, you know, Dr. Bruckner and uh, Dr. Mason are doing that with a lot of Australian entire teams want to go carnivore you know, because of the results that, that they're getting with individual athletes here, you know, in Australia. So, you know, the entire um, Australian national cricket team actually went keto carnivore under the supervision of Dr. Peter Bruckner and their, their game completely changed. They went, uh, not for the people who watch cricket, <laughs> I don't, but um, uh, it's very, obviously very popular in, in much of the world, certainly this part of the world. And they played England, who's, who's a top team in the world. And they got beat. So they play for five days in a row. They Australia lost all five days, right? So they went 0-5. Then six months later, they played India, who was top in the world, even better than England. And they beat them on all five days. So they went 5-0. and oh. What was the difference in between them? Professor Bruckner got to them and put them on a keto carnivore diet. And their, their performance radically improved. So yes, there are top athletes doing this. There are several all black rugby players, the New Zealand all black rugby players who are perennially, the, you know, one of the top teams in the world, if not the top team in the world for decades. And they have a number of these people as the, uh, as I, as I understand it, the Frank brothers on the New Zealand all blacks are doing a carnivore diet. One of them is 38 still playing top level international rugby for the best rugby team in the world. Well, 
South Africans uh, just won the World Cup, so technically second best at the moment, but they are always one of the best teams in the world. And um, and and he just signed a, a new contract, I believe, with the Crusaders at 38 years old. Generally, you're you're 10 years past your your shelf life, or your at least your peak at 38. And yet, this guy's still playing for one of the top teams in the world at the t- at the highest level, and just just killing it. And I think because of his diet. So, um, Dr. Mason uh, told me about a study I haven't seen yet. So this is this is secondhand information. But as he was describing it to me. Uh, they've actually done studies showing, looking at how much glycogen are in, because that, that's the argument. Okay, well, you can make glycogen and you can make blood sugar, but do you do it as fast, do you do it as quickly as someone just sucking down sugar water and those little sugar packets and things like that? And this study actually showed, yes, that the ketogenic diet uh, athletes, the ketogenic athletes actually replenish their glycogen faster than the carb, ad- than the carb athletes who are you know, su- sucking down sugar water and Gatorades and things like that. So you have an, a bottomless supply of energy, you you know, and you don't get sore, you don't run out of energy, you get a bottomless supply of energy and it replenishes more quickly than if you're just sucking down sugar water and things like that. And then the next day you have amazing recovery because you're not having all these inflammatory factors, you're not having all this these toxins in your bodies that are going to cause pain, stiffness, swelling, and stress on your body, make it more difficult to heal, make it more difficult to function. You do a big workout. You know, I think we've all been there, people that work out regularly have that experience of just being sore. And maybe, maybe I used to like it. I, and I talked to a lot of people, I like that soreness. It, knows, it makes me know that I did a lot of work. I pushed myself really hard. Okay, fine. But it's actually detrimental. It's stopping you from doing what you could do. So if you if you could do all that and you could do more, and then you just felt amazing the next day, you know how is that not better? And it is a sign that there's something wrong going on in your body. And when you get rid of all these things, you just don't even get sore anymore, and you get nearly instant recovery. And you can have a person run five marathons in five days without eating anything, and be fine as a result of it. So there are massive, massive, massive improvements to your health and athletic health and athletic ability when you're on this. Another thing that is that is that should not be, um, you know, that cannot be stressed enough, I see the testosterone levels in male athletes and just elderly men in general and just men in general dramatically increase. I had a, a young man who's 20 years old and he it looked like he had primary testicular failure. His testosterone was extremely low. He's 20 years old. It should be sky high. Put him on a carnivore diet, you know, told him to fix these things up. He he didn't even wasn't even able to sort of stick to it entirely, but you know, was, made a good effort and ate a lot more meat. He doubled his testosterone in in six weeks, hmm. right? So then he was now in a normal range, whereas before he was in a, an extremely poor range. Then there there are athletes that I've had on my on my program, such as Ryan Talbot. I've had on twice. He's he's one of the top track and field athletes in America. He's a D1 uh, NCAA Division I track athlete out of Michigan State. He set the school record for the decathlon in his first year of doing the decathlon, six months after he went carnivore. And he went mid-season, he transitioned mid-season. He said that, yeah, it was fine. He, he felt a bit funny for a couple of weeks, but it didn't actually slow down his performance. And then after that, it just, just went through the roof. He got tested. He got a whole bunch of blood tests done at uh, Michigan State. So he set a school record. He run, won the Big Ten. The next year he got second. He was a two-time All-American, right, immediately after going carnivores. Massive improvement. And so he did got a lot of blood tests done with his, with his school doctor, the team doctor. And they said, yeah, testosterone is fine. All these things are fine. You're doing great. Uh, there's, there's no problems here. He said, well, I don't feel great. So I, I know there's a problem somewhere. Um, I'm going to look at things myself. He found a carnivore diet, tried it. The next year they tested his blood again. His testosterone had nearly doubled. It went from like 760, which is actually really good for anybody, right? Went up to 1150, right? So it nearly doubled this massive increase. And as an athlete, as a, as a top athlete, that's, I mean, you know, it's legal steroids, right? And it's, and it's healthy too, because it's, it's physiological. It's your body doing it. You're not upending your body by putting in, foreign foreign hormones and and sort of screwing things around um a number of other um friends of mine athletes and rugby players and things like that uh, have, have seen the same effects 
and have gone uh, one gentleman uh, who plays for the U.S. national team in rugby, plays down in, in Houston for the Sabercats, uh, an MLR rugby team uh, down there. His testosterone went from like 550 to 1150 as well. So it more than doubled. And he's already a professional athlete. I mean, what the hell is that going to do for your performance? Right. So that's going to be a massive, massive thing. And, and obviously, women as well, it optimizes your hormones, not just going to jack up your testosterone. Meat isn't just man juice that's just going to turn you into a man. It's just going to optimize you as an individual, you know, where you are. So women optimize their hormones, men optimize their hormones, and both will increase their growth hormone and, and, and other sorts of things as well and get better recovery and, uh, and more effect. They'll get more bang for their buck. So if, you know, uh, someone who is not eating this way and someone who, who is eating a, a proper diet were to do the same workouts day after day after day after day, the carnivore athlete is going to get better results from that as a consequence because they're going to recover better. They're probably going to be able to push themselves harder at the time and they're going to, their body's going to heal more from it and get more uh, of a benefit from that as well. So, I could probably keep going on about that, but I, I think that's enough. Uh, but yeah, so there are many, many, many reasons why this is a massive improvement for health and athletic performance. Yeah, I, I've heard the testosterone reported from so many people uh, improving uh, eating the proper human diet carnivore. I, uh, you know, I can, we're kind of joking around with this like carnivore superpowers, but I guess the really interesting and encouraging mm -hmm. thing too is these really aren't superpowers. I really think these are things that they're just proper humans it's just that everyone else is at such a deficit yeah but we should we sh this is how everyone should be and that's that's why i was so upset when i realized that you know I, I started coming back on this and two weeks into it i felt so much better my body's working so much better and i was i was so much more athletic 38 fat and out of shape hadn't played a full season of rugby in three years and all of a sudden i felt like i was 22 again I felt better at 38 than I did it at 27 playing professional rugby training all the time because I wasn't doing a carnivore diet at 27. And so I felt like I was 22 when I was doing a carnivore diet. And I just felt absolutely outstanding. And I, I at 38, I went out and started playing, you know, professional rugby again and playing with the, the Seattle Seawolves, um, you know, Seattle Saracens and Seawolves were the same, same thing. So I grew up playing with Seattle as a kid. That was my, my first team and really, you know, um, where – you know where I, I i i learned everything else so I, my, my family really was was this team that sort of went back there and all the people that i played with are now in charge of the sea wolves and everything like that so i'm just like yep i'm back i'm doing this and i just felt amazing i was just at full pace uh dead sprint the whole time even even from day one i had not run properly in years and now here i am just booking it around the field and felt great so i was just like well at 22 I could do it when I was doing carnivore. I could just go as hard as I as as I wanted to, as push myself as hard as I could, and I, I couldn't wear myself out. So you know, I'm going to do that again. Let's see. I'm not going to ease into this. I'm just going to go, you know, balls to the wall and go. And it was it was great. I felt absolutely fantastic. So that is how we're supposed to work. That is how we're supposed to function. So if you don't function like that, something's wrong. Something's damaged you. Something is damaging you. And so if you get if you get rid of that, your body just starts working. You just drop the anchor. And and your body can can start working properly and and yeah you're right and I I feel like a superhuman and I feel like a different breed of human compared to myself at different times and in a lot of ways you know we are because our bodies are fundamentally working very differently completely differently than everybody else on earth who are chronically poisoning themselves and it, it's really sad to think about but people are poisoning themselves and they are being poisoned slow poison is still poison if you just damaging yourself a little bit and your body's not working the way it's supposed to work, that's poison. And so when you get rid of that and you drop that anchor and your body starts working amazingly, it's like you have superhuman powers. It's like you're a different breed of human because you're, it's so much better than what people are used to. Yeah. Well said. Good stuff. I, yeah, that, that's my one thing I always say to people too, that say they're so scared of starting carnivore or changing things. I'm like, you deserve to live at least one day feeling like I feel, or like Dr. Chafee mm -hmm. feels. It's such a shame that so many people are going to slowly poison themselves their entire life, be inflamed with brain fog, all these aches and pains and issues. And they're never going to know what it's like to, to really feel alive, like a proper human. It's amazing. So yeah. good stuff, Dr. Chafee. So should we take a couple of questions now? Sure.
All right, cool. We got Mike Hansen as a new YouTube member. Thank you, Mike. Um, anyone nice. that becomes a member to my channel, every penny we get from that goes to the Healing Humanity documentary. Same with the Super Chats. Uh, Pearl as well. Thank you, Pearl. We got a question from Thomas. I am Irish, 67, and have a history of all three skin cancers. I do get myself checked every six months while on this carnivore diet. Should this decrease the recurring cancer issues? Well, I mean, it should. I mean, there's, there's other factors that are going to be in play there. But um, yes, I mean, you should watch the the video um, that I did with Professor Thomas Seafried and that others have done with Professor Thomas Seafried as well. The guy's one of the top cancer uh, experts in the world. And he just shows that just cancer biology is such that if you're on like sort of a keto carnivore diet, this is going to greatly affect then the health of your mitochondria. And if you have healthy mitochondria, you really can't get cancer. And cancer cells need about 400 times the amount of glucose as normal cells called the Warburg effect, named after Otto Warburg, Nobel Prize winner in uh, medicine and physiology. So if you if you are eating a more proper diet, if you're not taking things in that damage your mitochondria, then this is much more likely that you will you will suppress your uh, any sort of skin cancers and things like that from recurring or starting fresh. And if you have any dancing around, this will help starve them out will it cure all cancers absolutely not but it can absolutely help the, in the prevention and treatment of of most if not all cancers all right we got a question from ramon ramen uh hi carrie and dr chafe i have a question regarding my father he developed stomach cancer that already spread to his liver and lymph nodes he gets chemo and stayed on the standard american diet apple juice is the only thing that stays down at the moment what should he do yeah, that's 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 really tough. I'm very sorry to hear that. It, if you're able to again watch that interview with Professor Thomas Seafried, I think that will give you a lot of good insight into this and how apple juice is really not what he needs to be eating right now. You know, if he's very skinny, very emaciated, which he almost certainly is, if he's not eating anything except apple juice, it's going to be a bit difficult. But even periods of fasting to get into ketosis is going to help starve out those cancer cells. And if you're drinking sugar, I mean, think about a, a PET CT, right? You do a PET scan and to look for different metastases is probably how they found all these different metastases in his body is by doing a PET scan. You take them into the, the scanner and, and it's a, it's a nuclear iodide test. So they, they give, um, they give a, an injection of uh, radio labeled glucose sugar, right? And that goes in the body. And then you just see all these points of Trump where it sucks up that sugar. And those are saying, oh, that's cancer, that's cancer, that's cancer, that's cancer, because it's sucking in all this sugar due to the Warburg effect. And so every time you drink apple juice, that's what that's doing. You're making these hot spots of, of metabolic activity. You're just dumping gasoline on the fire. And so that's that's really not what he wants to do. So there are so you know, ignoring the energy dynamics of cancer cells. And how you know you want to limit the amount of glucose available to them by not eating glucose in the first place. You're going to make some. You're not going to. You can't really stop that. But you know, the lower your blood sugar is, and the higher ketones are, it's called the GKI, glucose ketone index. That has been shown in clinical and preclinical trials to improve cancer outcomes. And so you're just you're just reducing the amount of available energy and resources that the cancer has to grow and spread. Ignoring that, all that aside, there are studies in 2019 and then 2020 showing that chemo and radiation are improved, the outcomes are improved by being on a ketogenic diet or in a state of ketosis, like periods of fasting during chemo and radiation, because they actually, being in a state of ketosis actually sensitizes the cancer cells to the chemo and radiation. So more cancer cells die from the chemo and radiation, and it protects your cells, your healthy cells, from the chemo and radiation. So you get less damage from it, your cancer gets more damage from it. So even if this didn't have anything to do with energy dynamics, which it does, and that's probably a large part of why it's uh, more effect, makes the chemo and radiation more effective because they're just a bit more vulnerable. They don't have as much energy to protect themselves and sort of you know slip around the chemo and radiation. But even if it didn't do any of that, it, you know it makes them more sensitive to chemo and radiation and makes you more protected from chemo and radiation. So even if he's just doing things on a standard you know process, what I am not encouraging him to stop his chemo or radiation or whatever treatment his oncologist have him on. 
um, this helps it. So, and this can be done on the side. It's not an either or, you know, this can be done with it and it complements it. It makes it work better. So I would definitely watch that and I would do, do your utmost to get him to watch that and hopefully, you know, get on some sort of ketogenic diet that, uh, that can help support his, his cancer treatment. And hopefully he does well. Yeah. Shout out professor Seafried. Just amazing, amazing work yeah. he's done. Question from Slender099, $10. Thank you. Uh, hi, Dr. Chafee. We need more doctors like you. I agree. It's hard trying to find a carnivore keto medical doctor, Houston, Texas area. What panels should I have looked at on my next checkup? Well, it just depends. I mean, I, I you know, if, if you're well, if you've been on carnivore for a long time, you don't have any issues, then you don't necessarily need to get any, any blood tests. You know, uh, Dr. Barry, um, I did a book called, um, what is it called? You know, sensible lab test or something like that. But anyways, you know, some of the things that he would sort of recommend people maybe get on a yearly basis. I think this largely applies to, you know, normies who are just like eating the standard diet and sort of seeing like where things are slipping off and, and starting to go, go astray. But for, for people on a carnivore diet, I think one thing that's worth checking is your folate and your B12, because some people are just low methylators and they, they need maybe a bit more liver. You're not going to need to really take liver is a supplement for for carnivores so you know if you're ever sort of lacking in anything generally liver just will sort that out or you know the other organs as well um not much you don't need much just a, you know a little bit each week and that should be fine um if you're first coming to a carnivore diet if you're if you've been nutritionally deficient and all these sorts of things you could do a number of different tests if you're just feeling a bit unwell and a bit out of it and, you, and that's why you're coming to it you know you can check all the different sorts of um of, of labs such as your thyroid, such as your, you know, androgens and hormones. If a woman, you're checking your estrogen uh, and men, your testosterone, DHEA, DHEA in women as well. And um, IGF-1 is a, is a marker of your growth hormone and how active that is. And checking different nutrients, B12, vitamin D, um, folate, as I said, uh, magnesium, zinc, selenium, these sorts of things are these trace elements that that generally people are a bit deficient in. I actually found talking to Maggie, she said that there was a a um a for, it, it, muscular dystrophy exists in cows. And it's exactly the same presentation as muscular dystrophy in humans. But in cows, it's known to be from a selenium deficiency. So when you see the cows start to develop like this, you give them like a, a selenium lick, a mineral lick, and it just just sorts it out. Right. And that sort of begs the question, well, it is ours nutrition from a nutritional deficiency as well. Anybody who knows anyone with muscular dystrophy, maybe check their all their different nutrients. Maybe see if you can get them on a carnivore diet. Check their selenium of all things. Maybe something else doing it, but in cows, it's selenium. No one checks their selenium. I it's just no one checks it. And so, you know, it's worth it's worth looking into anyway. Um, so you could check those sorts of things. And then uh, I, I never check cholesterol. It's a waste of time. It's not a marker of, of, of heart disease. And so I just, I just don't bother with it. You know, if people say, well, what about you? I don't care. I, I, I just don't care. I do not check that unless someone specifically asks for it. And then it's just completely academic. Like, yeah, if you want. But uh, it's, I think it's, it's useless for judging our, our risk for heart disease any further than you know, the low HDL and high triglycerides is a mark is, is one point against you in metabolic syndrome and metabolic syndrome increases your risk for heart disease by 600%. So that might be an issue, but if you're on a carnivore diet, that goes away. And so if you're feeling a bit unwell, you could sort of do a deep dive in your bloods and just see what's going on. If you have a significant deficiency, very low B12, most people are low B12 is, oh, it's in the range. If you're in the range, if you're in their range, you're low for B12 generally. And so people need to be at, at a higher level for that. And a lot of nutrients as well. So you want to get someone who actually understands what the optimal ranges are because the reference ranges that we get in labs at the moment are just an average for the community. So the first 2000 people that come into a lab each year, that is the reference range. And so that's why every single lab in every single city is a completely different reference range. It's, it's pretty ridiculous. So that's not the reference for optimal health. That's the reference just for the average in the community. When the average person is fat and sick and unhealthy, right? 92%, 93% of Americans have at least one metabolic disease. 70% of Americans are overweight or obese. So if you're in the reference range, you're in the, you're in the average 
you're, you're comparing yourself to average people. You're in the average. Oh, great. So I'm equivalent to someone who's overweight and metabolically sick. Great. That's exactly where I don't want to be. So you need to, you need to find someone who understands uh, different reference ranges, actual reference ranges for optimal health. And I'm, I'm actually going to try to convince, um, you know, the medical director at my facility who I've learned all this stuff from. Um, I mean, I knew that they, they were just averages for the community and that blew my mind, but I didn't know how to find optimal ranges. So I've learned those, those from him and I'm, I'm going to try to encourage him to, to maybe write a book on the subject, just like, you know, similar to Ken Berry's, maybe work that, that out together and, and send that out and then sort of put that together. But um, those are sort of the things that, that you could check if you wanted to do just a scatter blast look at um, oh, fasting insulin, fasting glucose, those sorts of things, your normal blood tests, all that sort of stuff. If you're starting out, you know, one, you can get that as a baseline. You can check that again in six months or a year or something like that and watch your improvements, fill any gaps that need you. I mean, if you're very hypothyroid, um, you know, it, it's it's all well and good to wait for your body to heal from hypothyroidism. If it does, it may not, but if it does, that's great. But you need thyroid hormone in the meantime. So if you're very hypothyroid, you know, it's it's probably a good idea to to get a prescription for that. If you're very low on B12, meaning that you're in the reference range of normalcy for B12 in most places, you know, you might need to get get a shot. In Australian numbers, the the reference range is generally between 140 and 650, sometimes up to 750 for B12. But anything below 400 can actually cause neurological damage. So there are studies showing that you get neurological damage and demyelination of your neurons by having B12 under 400. And yet this is this is most of the normal reference range. So that's really bad. And sometimes I'll give people an injection. If, if their B12 is, is under 400, I give them an injection. And they'll come back to me next time. They'll say within 20 minutes, it's like their brain turned on. And, and so, you know, this is, this is a major, 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 uh, issue for people now. Uh, so that's another, that's another, uh, thing with brain fog is it could be, you'd be critically low on B12 and now all of a sudden you're getting B12 and your brain turns on. And so and there's going to be weeks ahead of time that you're going to get more remyelination of your axons and, and healing of, of the structural components of your nervous system. It's going to make things even better. So, you know, it's worth checking those sorts of things. You know, when I, I've checked my bloods, you know, years on being a carnivore, they were all in, you know, very optimal levels, which is why the the medical director at, at the functional medicine clinic that I'm at, who's the, the main clinician there as well, um, at the time, I've sort of taken over for him. Uh, that's why he got interested in the carnivore diet. That's why he got interested in me working there was because my lab tests were were very good. He said that if you took 100,000 people off the street who were my age, that my bloods would be number one without a shadow of a doubt i'd been carnivore for maybe two years at that point so you know i don't know where i was before that but either way it, you know it, it gets it gets better you know so you can check those things early on you can check it for comparison i think that if you're not unwell it's sort of academic and so that's really up to you if you just want to have a look at this out of your own interest and just make sure that everything's in the right direction you have to also make sure that you're getting multiple data points because if you're if you're here, it's just a snapshot in time. You just take a look. This is what your bloods are right now, but you don't know what they are last month, next month, two months from now, six months from now, two years from now. So you need data points to see where you're going as well. So, but I'm I'm really of the opinion that if you're feeling really well, then you don't necessarily need to get blood tests. But if you want to make sure that you're optimizing things, sure, you can do that whole battery and uh, and see where you can improve things. All right. Uh, Duano, twenty dollars super chat. Thank you. Hi, gentlemen. Can uh, you please ex can I please get your thoughts on supplementing NMN and resveratrol while on carnivore diet? So all of these things have have mixed reports. So some people will say yes, this is the end all be all, and this is wonderful. All these things are preclinical trials done in animals and mechanistic data. So it's saying that look, this is this is how it should work, but does it actually work that way? Uh, we don't necessarily know for sure. We need more human trials on these things, long-term human trials, well-designed long-term human trials. Very difficult to do that. But either way, I think that you're getting, you're, you're already making up so much ground. You know, it says like, well, you know, there's resveratrol and metformin and, and um, rapamycin, this, and even aspirin, you know, prolongs life by a certain percentage or a certain number of years. Uh, expected for for humans, you know, because it extends, you know, 
life of mice and things like that by a certain percentage. Um, aspirin has a lot of data behind it for, as a longevity treatment, but is it, be, is it because it's making your, your system and your metabolism work better? Or is it just protecting from heart attacks and strokes and things like that because it's thinning out your blood and, and making your platelets not uh, quite so sticky. So you're doing all these things that are damaging yourself, damaging your, your arteries, damaging your artery linings, and that's causing clotting. And this is just sort of ameliorating the, 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 um, you know, the, the gravity of those, of those clots, who knows, you know, I think it's probably that it's probably we're doing things to damage ourselves. And this is sort of at least mitigating some of the damage from the, all this excessive clotting that we're doing. And, uh, you know, people that have clotting disorders have higher risks of strokes and different sorts of, uh, horrible, horrible issues as a result of that. So, you know, being on a bit of aspirin, could help that. But if you're not putting yourself in the position in the first place to have all that damage and clots in the first place, is it going to be a benefit after that? I would expect not. And so is the resveratrol, is the metformin, is the rapamycin improving things on top of just getting rid of this mess? You know, one of the things that metformin does is a diabetes medication, but it's also thought to be uh, you know, a longevity medication. You know, Dr. David Sinclair takes this himself. He says, Oh, this is this is probably really good. Okay. But he also fasts for five days every three months because he's saying you need to get your insulin down, you need to get your insulin down because this has so much autophagy and this and that and blah, blah, blah. And that's why he's taking the metformin as well, because it lowers your blood sugar, it lowers your uh, threshold for insulin sensitivity. And all of that can be accomplished by just not eating carbohydrates, right? So if you're just eating a carnivore diet, you're, you're already doing something much better for your body than metformin can ever do. I mean, that's just sort of putting a Band-Aid on a problem as opposed to like fixing, you know, it's like putting a Band-Aid on a broken leg, really. I mean, it's just really not the, the appropriate thing to do. Like you should, you know, address the underlying condition. So um, I, I just am... I don't really look into that stuff because I'm not I'm I'm not all that interested because you know we're talking about these things maybe extend your life by you know a couple of years five ten years twenty years say it's not but let's say you're already getting fifty years back by just eating on a carnivore diet is this going to improve on top of that we have no data we have no way of saying one way or the other maybe you know but I'm I'm working on a hundred thirty year timeline anyway I plan on living that long naturally. And so I figure I have time, you know, I think I have time, just wait a few decades, see what the information comes in. Hopefully at that point, people understand we're carnivores and we start doing these tests in the context of people who are eating a more natural diet. You know, does, does metformin and resveratrol extend a lion's life? Who's just eating meat? If so, yeah, all right, maybe maybe we'll think about this. But you know, if it, if it is really just undoing some of the damage that we're doing to ourselves because we're eating an improper diet, which I think is more likely the case, then probably not all that interested in dumping this dumping this stuff in my body. And there are there are reports and studies that come out completely counter to these things, saying that they these things actually don't help; they can actually cause harm. And and we're just looking at the data wrong because we don't have good data on this. We're just trying to extrapolate you know, information from, you know, pretty, you know, from, from data that's just, that's just not robust. We don't have the kinds of studies that we need, these long-term, you know, multi-decade, multi-generational sort of studies that, that can, you know, cut out all the different sorts of uh, confounding factors. I mean, it's just, it's almost impossible to do that. And it's certainly unethical to do that. So, um, you know, to do it properly. So I, I sort of re reserve judgment. I, I think the, the data can go either way. I don't think any of the data is applicable to anyone on a carnivore diet. I think a large amount of these things are just going to uh, un, uh, you know, mitigate a bit of the damage that you're doing just from eating crap. And if you're not eating crap, you know, that, that your body's sort of doing, doing what it's supposed to do anyway, and you're, and you're getting back 50 years of excellent health. So I think that's, that's where we start. And, you know, I, we have time to, uh, to wait things out and see how see what data comes in. All right. Maria, uh, super sticker, $10. Thank you so much. Uh, Bernog, $5. Will the carnivore diet help with ventricular ischemia? My sister is a bit worried as her doctor keeps trying to put her on statins. Um, ventricle ischemia. 
So, you know, ischemia is obviously lack of blood, ventricle, ventricles of the heart. So I'm, I'm assuming that, that we're talking about occlusions in the heart and sort of narrowing of the coronary arteries. Um, that's what that sounds like. It's just, it's just sort of uh, worded in a way that I haven't really heard before, but um, we, we don't have interventional data showing that keto carnivore diets reverse uh, atherosclerotic disease yet, but there are more and more and more anecdotal cases, people saying that, you know, this was my occlusion. Now it's resolved on these, on these sorts of dietary interventions. And uh, I actually just had a, a gentleman in my, my Patreon group uh, named Chip, who last year he had uh, shown on imaging, he had 100% occlusion of his right carotid ar uh, artery. Now it's only, um, now it's only, uh, uh, it's not completely occluded. I forget the exact level, but it's like, you know, you look at it, it's just like, you know, it's, it's really occluded as like the high level of occlusion, but it's not 100%. So that's, that's actually going backwards. So it actually is resolving that the lean mass hyperresponder data coming out from Dave Feldman and Nick Norwitz showed that after on, uh, you know, an, an average of 4.6 years on keto carnivore diets, high fat meat based keto carnivore diets with massively elevated LDL, but high HDL and low triglycerides, that there was no progression in atherosclerotic plaque. And in fact, the trend was to have less atherosclerotic plaque. So that is, I, I think will be shown going forward. We don't have, we don't have as much hard data on that yet, but I would expect that that to be forthcoming. And either way, it's going to improve her life and her health in massive ways. And so I, I, I would say that it's at least not going to make things worse. And we can see that by the lean mass hyper responder data, even with massively elevated LDL, because LDL does not cause heart disease. That was a con, that was a fraud that should be just thrown out. I mean, I, I long for the day that we never have to talk about this crap again. And someone says, well, but what about that? It's not a thing. Let's just, we're playing their game. We're talking about it. We're keeping them relevant. They're not relevant. They're frauds and charlatans. So let's just stop. Let's just stop even addressing cholesterol. It's like, that was a fraud. That's not a thing. We're moving on, you know, and just, and just move on because we should, it's, it's a waste of time. So statins, everyone's going to put, you know, most people are going to try to put them on statins. But um, if you look at my my video on on uh, the truth about cholesterol and heart disease on YouTube. I go through all the data about how this just really is not what it seems. And this was a fraud perpetrated by the sugar companies in the beginning used as cholesterol as a scapegoat. Um, you can look at um, the work of Dr. Um, Asim Mahotra, who is a UK based cardiologist who wrote a book called uh, A Statin Free Life. And as he counsels as as he counsels his patients, he tells them, what the data is and what the data shows from the drug companies. And one thing you can say for sure about a study that a drug company does or that a certain industry funds is that that study is going to support that industry that funded it because that's why they paid for it. And if they didn't support it, they just wouldn't publish it. And that happens all the time. So this was published by the statin companies and they showed that if you have had a heart attack, I don't know if your sister's had a heart attack, but if you've had a heart attack and you stay on statins for at least five years and then for the rest of your life, take it every single day, that you will, ex you will extend your life. Okay, that's great. That's what we want. But how much? Five days. Five days. Not weeks, not months, not years. Five days. And this is their own data. So that's the best it's ever going to look, right? Because they've designed it to look as good as it's ever going to look. And if you have not had a heart attack, it does not extend life. So the point of taking medication, the point of trying to reverse disease is that it extends life, right? We're not, we're not just taking medicine for the sake of taking medicine, right? And so you also look at your CAC score, your coronary artery, cal coronary artery calcium score and say, wow, this is elevated. You need to be on a statin. Okay, great. Does a statin reduce my CAC score? No, actually it makes it go up. Well, then why am I taking it? Well, because now it's stabilizing the plaque. So it's less it's less of a problem. But I thought you said it was a problem that my CAC score was up. Yeah, but only if it's not done by the by the statins. I mean, that makes no sense. These are mutually exclusive thoughts that cannot be held at the same time. And yet they are. You know, this is this is Orwellian double think. We have two things that, com that are completely opposite, polar opposite, and yet you believe them, right? 
that CAC score being higher is bad and is a higher risk for heart disease. And raising your CAC score with statins is an improvement and lowers your risk for heart disease. It makes no bloody sense. And so I just don't look at this as, as uh, a problem. I just do not care about um, LDL levels and ischemia. You know, we, we've been we've been doing what they said. We've been reducing fat, reducing meat, increasing fruits and vegetables, increasing polyunsaturated fats, taking statins, taking other uh, cholesterol lowering medications, eating tons of wretched fiber because it lowers our, our cholesterol. And what's happened? More people are getting atherosclerosis. More people are getting cardiovascular disease. More people are having first time heart attacks and strokes. They're just surviving. So there's a peak in, in cardiovascular death in the 60s and 70s and that has come down but more people have stopped smoking and we have better interventions S simply the ambulance system has improved you have people out in the country who have a heart attack normally they die out in the country because you can't get them to a tertiary center to go to a cath lab and get and get this thing fixed now you can in australia a lot of people live rurally and we have the royal flying doctors we have a private jet sent out you know, to BFE and pick someone up and fly them back to Perth or Sydney or Brisbane or Melbourne, and they can get treatment. Whereas otherwise it would take them, you know, two days to drive in from the country. They'd be dead at that point. So you can fly these people in, you can get people access to healthcare. So our access to healthcare, our access to interventions is improving. Our, our quality of interventions, our, our number of interventionalists is all improving. So that's why deaths are going down, but the prevalence and incidence is going down. The, you know, the amount of people in the society as a percentage of the population is uh, with heart disease and new heart attacks is increasing. The number of new diagnoses of heart disease, atherosclerosis and, and cardiovascular disease each year is increasing around the world and deaths around the world is actually increasing as well out of proportion with population growth. So there's more deaths each year than the population is growing each year as well. And you know that can be a bit funny because different generations have different amounts of people. However, that is the case. There are more deaths and heart disease and all these sorts of things increasing each year than the population is increasing as a proportion. So what I would do is, is go on a carnivore diet. I would recommend everybody goes on a carnivore diet with any medical issue. I cannot say that it will reverse her um, coronary ischemia, but I can tell you that it will improve her life in a thousand other ways and should at least stop the progression. And according to preliminary data, it does seem that it can be reversed. And whether she goes on a statin or not is, is her decision that she needs to make with her doctor, but she should at least look into the data and what it can actually do for her and what the side effects are. All right. Yeah, I want to be respectful of your time, Dr. Chafee. We got some more super chats trickling in here. Are you okay for a couple more? Sure. All right. Um, here we go. Do you guys know if a body can recover from 20 years of eating plants, or will uh, you lifeline? Will your lifeline be shorter? Is there any science on it? Um, no, I don't. I don't think we know either way. I think your body can can recover from quite a lot, and so you know, people in their 60s, 70s, and 80s are going carnivore, and they're coming out of nursing homes as a result of that. So, at the very least, you're going to get a lot more life. You're going to get a lot more benefit from that. So, it's uh, you you may or may not make it to 120 or 130, but you're certainly going to make it a lot longer than you would have otherwise, and you're going to be a lot healthier the whole time too. So, it's it's definitely still worth it. Carnivore Odyssey, $5. Thank you. And all the people who have uploaded their journeys on the carnivore lifestyle, I'm vlogging too. It's important to share, to raise awareness. Yes. Awesome. Yeah. Everyone definitely. check out yeah. Carnivore yeah, Odyssey. No yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, and thank you for, for vlogging and, and doing these sorts of things. The more voices we get out there, the better. You know, we have that. God, I mean, how many vegan channels are out there? It's disgusting. Right. So, you know, but, you know, a lot of these vegan channels, I mean, these are, these are well meaning people. They're just like us. In fact, I, I would say like 60% of the people that follow me were vegan at one point and, uh, or maybe directly vegan right before they, they were, they went carnivore. The same motivations are there. They want to be healthy. They want to do the best things for themselves and their kids and their lives and the planet and all these sorts of things. And they just, you know, there's a lot of propaganda out there. There's a lot of misinformation that's leading people down, you know, the wrong path. And they are getting hurt. They are getting sick. And so, you know, it, but the motivations are correct. And so those same motivations eventually lead them to carnivore. And so the more people that we have in that space, hey, I was vegan for 12 years and I got sicker and sicker and sicker and sicker. I did everything right. I did all the different things. I'm doing exactly what you're doing. It will catch up to you. And now I'm doing this. And 
you know, most of the time the vegan, like people say, you know, we talk about like the transition period and all these sorts of things. Sometimes there can be some teething issues in the first couple of weeks, um, you know, energy levels and this, that, and the other. That can happen with people coming from an omnivorous diet. They're eating a lot of meat. Most of the time when I talk to people that, that have been vegan or vegetarian for a long time, it's like instantaneous. It's like my brain turned on. It was like day two, I just felt like a new person. And that's because you're getting these nutrients your body's been so deprived of for so many years. Your body's just like, oh, thank God. And you just feel so much better as a result of that very quickly. And so thank you for, for doing your channel. And, and hopefully more and more people, if you're thinking about do it, do it. You know, there's so many people, you know, I saw Bill in the chat as, as well. Bill, not from, from Alaska, you know, amazing story, uh, uh, that he has, people should check out his channel and, and his channel grew massively quickly and people are interested in this sort of stuff and because they might be in the same situation and they might have loved ones in the same situation. And, you know, something that, you know, I, I came into this, you know, two years ago or so it's, yeah, it doesn't. That seems a bit longer than that, but it, you know, it's two years now. It's not that long. And at the time I thought, well, there are people saying things, the things that I want them to say, what I want to get this information out there. And most people saying most of the things that I want. So, you know, maybe I'm just sort of missed the boat. Maybe I, I don't need to add, throw my hat in the ring because, you know, people are already saying the things that are important. And so, you know, maybe it's not as important for me, or maybe it just won't be it's just like, oh yeah, well, everyone's saying that, you know, what, what's special about you, but I decided to do it. And I decided to sort of just make some videos and just sort of talk about things in the way that I thought they deserve to be spoken about. And, you know, it, and it resonated with people. And there are some people that messaged me and said, I've been sort of flirting with a carnivore diet. Uh, but then I saw your video talking about X, Y, or Z and it, that made sense to me. And so I said, okay, I'm going to do this. And there are going to be people that, that watch Carrie and that have the exact same thing. I've seen Dr. Chavis, I've seen Dr. Barry, and it's kind of, oh, well, maybe it's just them. But then I saw Carrie and the way you said it, that made sense to me, and that's why I'm going to do this. There are people all around the world that, that you are going to speak to more clearly to you know than, than anyone else can. And so everybody having a channel, having something, and talking about it, you know, you're going to resonate with people more than others will. So it is definitely worth it and getting more voices out there talking about even, even the negatives. People say, hey, I didn't have a great experience and here's what happened and here's why. That helps people navigate things when maybe, okay, well, maybe I won't do it that way. Maybe I'll do this other way. you know. And then having these conversations and say, well, this I wanted it to help this thing. It helped these other things, but it didn't help that thing. That's all good information because we're still trying to figure out you know, all the different things that this, this can help with. So it's always great to have more and more voices, you know, out in this space. So thank you everyone who does that. Yeah. A hundred percent. And the documentary we're doing healing humanity, that's the whole idea behind it. It's the documented mm. stories and examples that help. Cause I don't think you could tell someone like, Hey, you should do carnivore. But if you're like, look, this is what I did and this is what happened for me. And this is what happened for carnivore odyssey. This is what happened for bill. Um, that's, what's mm -hmm. going to get people to, to change your mind. So, and if, if yeah. anyone's interested too, we're still looking for more stories for our documentary. Um, and I always encourage people that register. We have our website in the description below. Start a YouTube channel because that's what Bill Knott did. That's what Jeff De Prosper mm -hmm. did. And that's a good way to follow people. Plus, it's so beneficial for the individual um, themselves to keep them on track and share their story. So Lucy, $5, five pounds. Uh, been carnivore for five months, but had low energy for over one month and have high zinc. Other blood levels are okay. Had four months chemo in 2022. Any advice, please? Well, I mean, the chemo, your body's going to take a while to recover from that anyway. So I would just be patient with that. You know, it's been five months. Most people are pretty much adapted at that point, but I've seen it go as long as six months or a few cases, people that their their health and energy levels improve dramatically. Uh, if you have high zinc, uh, according to their reference range, it's probably in the exactly the right range. Um, high is relative when you're talking about the, the normal reference ranges. Like I said, most of these reference ranges are too low. Most people are malnourished. Most people are sick. And so those reference ranges are out of balance. And so if your zinc is high, I would bet that it's actually good. So if you, if you have B12, that's not high you have low B12 in my opinion. If you have zinc that's not high, you have low zinc in my opinion. Same for magnesium, same for vitamin D. So that is, um, I would probably not worry about the zinc. Uh, I don't know your zinc numbers. They could actually be high, but if you're just, if you're not taking a supplement and you're just getting this from meat, then I, I really don't think that that would, that would apply. Um, I have a, I have a, 
a, a video that goes about like being tired on a carnivore diet, like tired on a carnivore diet. People can look up. There's a couple of things that people can, can troubleshoot. If you're eating enough, if you're eating fatty meat and water and you're not eating anything else. And that's one of the things that people don't realize. They say, well, I'm doing a carnivore diet. And then you find out they're having monk fruit, sugar and erythritol and stevia and, you know, milk and dairy and, you know, dairy can, can sort of slow people down as well, even though it's, it is fine for most people. Um, and they're having you know, avocado and this, whatever, you know, if, if you're not doing strictly meat and water and then just go down to strictly meat and water, I mean, that's always, that's always the first step. Well, what's happening? Well, it could be that you're eating something that's disagreeing with you. Cut it out. You know, just eat meat and water. If you're only eating meat, but you're eating various meats, go to just beef and lamb. You know, just see what that does for you. Make sure you're eating enough. Make sure you're eating enough fat. If you're eating during the day, you're going to get tired after you eat. That's just a normal consequence of, of eating a high uh, nutritional um, dense meal, right? And so there are a number of different things. If you're doing all of those things right and you sort of go through the list of all the things on my, you know, getting tired on a carnivore diet video, um, just give it time. You know, your body's recovering. You had chemo. Um, and you know, it just could be that your body's just going to take a little longer than others. So just focus on other things, focus on your health. Otherwise, make sure you're getting enough and just, just give it time most and get a lot of fat, a lot of fat. People need like one to two grams of fat for every one gram of protein. It's a lot more fat than most people have ever eaten in their entire life. And it scares people. You need it. It's an essential nutrient. It's not a calorie source. It is, there's essential fatty acids that you have to have or you don't make it very well. There are essential fat soluble nutrients that you have to have or you'll die and you won't, won't be very healthy. So just make sure you're getting enough, make sure you're getting enough fat. And yeah, hopefully, hopefully that uh, gets better soon. And you can also be sick. People do get sick on carnivore. It just feels different. And you usually just feel tired and run down. So that's a possibility too. Five dollars from Logan. Girlfriend loves the carnivore as much as me. Feel better in all areas. She's fit already and afraid of getting too skinny. How to offset that? Uh, just just make sure you eat, eat much you know, uh, as much as your body's asking you for. You know, if you're under eating, then you're you're going to just you know lose a bit of weight. So you know, most people will lose weight early on, even if they're very slender, because this is water weight, inflammation, and glycogen and that carries water with it. And intramuscular fat, people don't realize that, that a lot of uh, energy gets deposited as intramuscular fat. It's called myosteatosis. Lane Norton doesn't think this exists. He doesn't look at MRIs every day. This is a thing. It has a name. It's called myosteatosis. And on MRIs, we see very commonly people have these fat depositions in the muscles that are, uh, it's like human marbling, as you know, Dr. Sean O'Mara refers to it. And so when, when uh, cattle are uh, being fattened up and getting that marbling, they're given a lot of grains and carbs. They get that marbling because of that. We get that marbling because of that as well. And you can see this on MRI, regardless of what people like Lane Norton think, who are not clinicians and don't look at MRIs. So the thing is, you're going to lose some of that unhealthy weight. That's going to go away. That's normal. But you don't want that. That's That is unhealthy weight. And you don't want that there. And so if you're exercising and you're eating enough and you're eating until fatty meat stops tasting good, then you're not going to lose any lean body mass. You're not going to lose any lean muscle mass or bone tissue. And so if you're, you'll lose that unhealthy weight for a bit, but then you might actually start putting on weight. You start putting on healthy uh, lean mo body mass, like bone, like muscle, and especially if you're working out. You just need to make sure you're eating enough. It's very easy to under eat on a carnivore diet. So you may not feel hungry. Oh, I don't think I need to eat that. You do. At least try to eat once a day. Um, if not twice a day, keep eating fatty meat until it stops tasting good. Not be, not until you say, oh, I could stop. I don't feel like I need to until it stops tasting good. That's when your body actually wants you to stop. All right. The carnivore boss. Uh, hi, Dr. Chafee. Have you heard of any cases where carnivore helps someone with Pompe's disease? My friend has two sons diagnosed under a year ago. Um, you know, the thing is, is that a, a lot of these things are, are going to be sort of anecdotal. Um, and so, you know, anything that sort of comes in is, is going to be, um, you know, just, just personal, you know, people's personal experiences. And so, you know, it's hard to say, you know, you know, I, I've seen, I've seen 
literature and data on autoimmunity and Crohn's disease, and I've seen thousands of cases improve. So I can say pretty confidently, you know, if you if you stop eating plants and you just eat red meat and water, your Crohn's will go away. Your rheumatoid arthritis will go away. These other various autoimmunities will go away. Um, with things like Pompe's disease, that's 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 very uh, uncommon, and so it's um, it's one of those things that um, that that you don't see enough of that you can say like I've seen thousands of these things. Um, it's a it's a you know it's it's not something that I I'd normally treat. You know I know about it peripherally. It's a glycogen storage disease, and I'm trying to remember if this is the one that. Dr. Eric Westman spoke about, I'm pretty sure that it is, but he spoke that there was, there was a couple, um, people that came up to him that had this sort of glycogen. Basically what it is, is, is you, you can't utilize glycogen properly in your muscles. You get a lot of muscle weakness. So you walk down the street and you just go, you know, 50 feet and you're exhausted. Like you just had a, you know, you know, crazy workout and people are very embarrassed by this. So they, you know, pretend to tie their shoes, look in the uh, shop window and just sort of, you know, try to recover. And then they sort of go and they just sort of, you know, meander down the road and, uh, and, and take their time with it because they have to. And, uh, Dr. Eric Westman found that, um, some people were coming up to him at different conferences saying that they had these, these glycogen storage disorders. And I think it in fact was Pompe's disease. Um, but if it wasn't, it was something similar and they went on ketogenic diets and they found that it completely resolved it, right? Because your muscles actually can run on ketones and that's what people don't understand especially the you know the the gym bros that are like oh yeah you have to have glucose to run your muscles you don't actually you know they run perfectly fine on ketones and you have glucose available anyway all the people that say well you have to have glucose for this and that like you don't have to have glucose you don't have to eat glucose to get glucose in your body first of all you have an abundance of this stuff and so, you know, these people found that their, their, their muscle weakness and tiredness just went away because their, their bodies could run on ketones. And so he actually ended up publishing that and actually had a case series of people with this uh, published. They all improved on uh, just a ketogenic diet, just switching your metabolic state. So your muscles had a, had a supply of ketones available. So it is, it is very possible uh, at this point, it's in the, the level of case series reports on it in the literature, um, which is, you know, a few isolated examples. So take that for what it is, but you know, it's, it's no skin off anyone's back to give this a try for a couple of months and see what it does for you. And all that studies can ever do for you is help guide you in a direction to, uh, you know, on how to live your life. Right. So this says that they, this could, this could help you and you try it and it helps you great. If this says, oh, this is definite, like this is definitely going to improve your life and it makes your life worse. If it does the opposite of what it says, well, it's a dumb study. It doesn't, that doesn't matter. It's wrong. Studies are not science. You can use a scientific method and, and publish data based on that, but that, it's not science itself. It's academia. And so the actual science is, is trial and error and experiment with yourself first and foremost. So you have a study, you have enough studies and enough data to suggest this might improve my life. And in these ways, you try it. If it does, then great. You were right. Your hypothesis is validated. If you have the studies, it doesn't matter what the study says. It doesn't matter where it comes from. It doesn't matter how brilliant the people were who did it. If you then experiment with yourself and you come out and it has the exact opposite result, it's wrong. It doesn't matter. And if thousands and thousands and millions and billions of people are having the wrong outcomes and heart disease is getting worse and diabetes is getting worse and cancer is getting worse and autoimmunity is getting worse, based on these very intelligent people uh, and their advice, it's wrong, it's bad advice. So that's all it comes down to. So give it a try and uh, and and it's it is, it's gonna improve their life dramatically. I mean, there's still kids, their body's gonna improve and dramatically develop better if on a carnivore diet anyway, it could very well uh, get rid of this issue. I just wanna say real quick, well done, Dr. Chafee. Uh, we've done several videos together, the 24 hour live stream, and I keep waiting for someone to stump you. And this Pompe's disease is pretty obscure. Yeah. I was Googling it in the background and you like nailed exactly what it is. So that's yeah. pretty, pretty impressive. Matthew Newkirk, $2, thank you. Hot water, beef tallow, smoke salts, and blend it. All right. Nice. Any question on that one? There you go. <laughs> Uh, good cat, 1982, five pounds, been carnivore almost two years now, but what do I say 
to people uh, who say, but what about Asians and other populations that eat loads of rice? They're much shorter and much, much sicker. Right. I mean, the diabetes and chronic disease rates in China and India are massive. I mean, they're through the roof. One in four uh, men in India will die of heart disease. Right. So, I mean, that, that that's not who you want to model your life after. And so, um, you know, if you, you people, anyone who who seriously brings up the China study is not someone you need to seriously talk to because it's it's just the biggest force. And so I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't worry about that. Like, yeah, okay, Asians eat rice. So what, you know, I mean, the most Americans eat rice and everything else, right? So most, most populations are plant-based. You, know, you go to Hong Kong, Asian, uh, Asian city in China, they, I'm sure they eat rice, but you know what they also eat is, is they eat more meat per capita per day than any other, uh, you know, uh, developed nation or people studied they also have the longest life expectancy of anybody in that same category so you know what we've been told is is not all that true the blue zones are a complete farce first of all those were uh, a lot of these things are pension fraud these people found out that when they actually got a hold of their uh, birth certificates and things like that they were you know 20 30 years younger than they said they were and that's because they were in very poor areas and they they wanted to help subsidize their life by getting pensions. And so they lied about their age so that they could get their pensions early. And then they had, you know, parents and grandparents who maybe died 20 years ago, but they kept saying that they were alive and they were there so that they could keep getting their pensions and so that they could they could have a bit more money from the government. So this really just comes down to pension fraud, a lot of these things, and, and also just flat out fraud on the on the side of the blue zone. Uh, study, you know, people, it's not even a study. It was, it was, you know, it was someone's personal opinion. They observed some things and just said, Hey, this is what I observed. And they lied. They flat out lied. They were saying these guys were all plant-based. They weren't. Most of them eat much more meat than the rest of the population. So, you know, I, it, there's so many ways to attack that, but you know, the flat, fact of the matter is, is that most people in Asia are, are very unwell as a population. So no use in, in even entertaining that. All right. Um, Ra Raymond or Ramon, uh, this is a follow-up from the earlier one, I guess. Thank you so much for your response regarding my father. Again, he's very weak and barely able to walk. If nothing stays down, should he just fast or should I try to throw meat in the mixer? <sighs> yeah, you know, it, it really depends. You know, I mean, the thing, thing with fasting during, um, during uh, cancer treatments, it can be very helpful for lowering the GKI. You want to get that below two or below one if you can. Uh, and fasting really helps with that. Um, but you have to eat enough. I mean, if you're not eating enough, you're not getting enough nutrients, so you're going to die. Now, apple juice is not enough. So he's he's going to get nutritionally deficient there and he's going to suffer uh, as a result of that health-wise. So not drinking apple juice is, I think, still you know, uh, better, you know, fasting, I think is still better than, than drinking apple juice. If he is able to eat, he should be eating meat. Yeah. Throw it in the mixer, throw it in the blender, get him like some meat slurry or something like that. Um, see, whatever he can do pate, you know, that that's, that's generally pretty palatable, uh, by people. And so, um, periods of fasting is okay, but you have to have refeeding periods as well. So you're not losing too much weight. And, you know, especially when you're getting into the elderly populations who may be a bit frail and to begin with, you have to be very, very careful with that. And so episodes of fasting, sure, have to get enough nutrition, fatty meat nutrition on, on the other days though. So he's not losing too much weight. That's very important. All right, Dan, uh, Don, ten dollars. What is the nutritional makeup of break breast milk? Does it depend on the mother's diet? I'm I'm assuming that's just breast milk. I've never heard of break breast milk, but yeah, I think so. <laughs> but, um, so I, it does depend on the mother's diet. So that's the thing. I, I don't know of of any you know hard sort of um, of any. Well, I'm sure there. I'm sure there are places you can find these sorts of things. I've never looked them up, but um, I, I don't think they've they've ever looked at, at people of different diets and, and what's going in there. But they probably have. That's actually probably a good question. I don't think they certainly haven't done it with carnivore, but I've seen people that have switched to a carnivore diet while breastfeeding and the child's development massively improved. So obviously something is coming through 
uh, differently. You're not bringing different sort of toxins or things that are curtailing the development and growth of their child. And so you, know, you get rid of those things, you're just getting the nutrients and then, and then the baby starts developing and growing much faster. So, you know, that does happen. And yes, depending on what you're, you're, um, eating, that's going to affect your breast milk and that's going to affect your child's health and development. There are accounts of people around the world. It's still very rare, but you, it is making the news now. And I've seen, I see a couple every year, uh, at least I don't even scour the news. It's just, they just sort of pop up, uh, uh, you know, vegan parent, I, well, yeah, several a year now, unfortunately, of vegan parents, you know, putting their kids on a vegan diet and the kids dying as a result of that and being, you know, they get put in jail for neglect, um, uh, for, for killing their kid basically, which is devastating. I mean, of course these people don't want their child to die. They, they're convinced that this is the right thing to do for their child because they've been convinced by, idiots and assholes and, and greedy bastards who are trying to sell a product that this is the best thing for their life and for their kids. And, and it's killed their child, not, you know, screw your own health. It's killed their kids, you know, and that that's devastating. And, and there are report, there are news reports. People can look this up. I've, I see a few every year of vegan women whose children die from their breast milk. Right. So this is obviously clearly, you know, fundamentally nutritionally deficient and potentially even has a higher toxic load than than the baby can handle and uh, deal with. So it is going to change depending on on what the mother eats. Absolutely. And the mother and, and the milk is, is is going to be nutritionally deficient if the mother is nutritionally deficient and deprived. And, and you know, nature favors the mother over the child. So if the mother needs certain nutrients and by says we can't put this in the milk, you know, it's better for the mother to survive and the baby to die and the mother to go on and have more kids later than for the mother to die. And then the baby's going to die anyway, because nothing's going to take care of them. So that's how, generally how nature works. And so I would expect that to be the case in breast milk as well. And which is probably why these, these vegans and plant-based people are having kids that are dying on breast milk, which is, you know, tragic. Uh, zinc 316, two pounds, constipated for 14 days, worried, 80, 20 fat to protein. Yeah. So you have to, you have to define what we're talking about. Constipated, we constipated because you're not, you're having infrequent bowel motions or because you're having dry, hard, difficult to pass stools. That's what constipation is. The Bristol stool chart, B R I S T O L stool chart. You look at that and that tells you if you're constipated or not based on the, the formation and consistency of your stool. You can go once a month, once a year, once a decade, once a lifetime. If it's a if it's a soft, uh, normal consistency, you're not constipated. So it could be, and traditionally thought that you know if you haven't gone for two weeks, then you're it's because you're blocked up, and there's just this boulder that's stuck there, and you're going to need an enema or some sort of uh, you know uh, bowel prep to you know, blow this stuff out. But um, that's not the case for us because you, you absorb 98% of the meat that you eat. Well, with plants, you can't, you only absorb about 5%, 95% or so are completely indigestible and it has to go out. So that's where we have a lot of bulk in our stools when we're eating this garbage because your body can't use it. It needs to get rid of it because it's waste. So if that's not the case, if you if, if it's just, you are getting the dry, hard, constipated stools. You're not eating enough fat. If you're ever constipated, actually constipated on a carnivore diet, by definition, you are not eating enough fat, period, end of story. So you increase the fat until that stool is soft and you'll be fine. All right. Um, Flo, uh, hi, can you tell, tell me something about how carnivore affects Raynaud's syndrome? Can it be cured? Love both of your work. Uh, again, this is, this is sort of in the realm of anecdotal evidence, but yeah, it can. I mean, it's, uh, this is sort of an autoimmune issue. It's associated with other autoimmune issues like lupus. And yes, this can absolutely be sorted out. Like my, you know, my girlfriend, Elle, she, uh, I don't think she ever got it diagnosed, but, you know, or talk, talking to me, telling me about it. I was just like, I think you have probably have rain outs and it's gone now. So she doesn't have that. And, and a number of accounts have said that as well. Any autoimmune issue is going to improve. Any and all autoimmune issues are going to improve that I've seen so far. And so, yes, it can it can definitely improve. All right. Last one here. B-Dog, $10. Thank you. Counting calories sucked, but with calories in, calories out, I lost weight, enjoying a variety of foods in a deficit. Lane Norton suggests carnivores benefits is from weight loss. Can you explain why carnivore beats calories in, calories out? Uh, well, because calories in, calories out is is fundamentally flawed as as a concept. So, 
you know, the amount of calories that you cut me because it's, it's the, a calorie is not a calorie is not a calorie. The calories that you get from I me, mean, we are not combustion engines. We don't burn energy. We're not a steam locomotive where we're just burning fuel and that's heating up a, a tank of, of, and, and creating steam, right? We are chemical factories and we put in chemicals in our body and they have chemical reactions. So stevia and, and erythritol, they don't have calories. However, they do have chemical reactions in our body. And in animal studies with stevia, they give them one can of, of soda equivalent with stevia in it and reduces their fertility rate by 55%. Okay. So this is, oh, it doesn't have a calorie. So therefore it does nothing in our body. That's, that's infantile. So um, the, the other thing is, is that, you know, people like um, you know, Lane and, uh, and Rhonda Patrick have said, well, you know, well, Rhonda Pat Patrick specifically said that, uh, on Joe Rogan's podcast specifically said that, you know, people that go on, a, you know, elimination diets like a carnivore diet, they tend to eat less calories over time. And so they lose weight because it's just calories in calories out, not, you know, failing to recognize the significance of the fact that people are doing this naturally. They're not counting calories. Their body is telling them to eat less calories. If you want to call it that, because calories is a stupid metric. Um, you know, because we don't use things in, in that manner. Right. So, you know, that that is very significant that your body is telling you by natural urges that you don't need to eat as much also calories don't weigh anything calories a measure of heat energy and so if you have a glass of water and you heat it up by 20 degrees it does it has more calories is that going to does it weigh more is it going to make you weigh more no because the calories are, are useless it's meaningless as a measure of of weight right atoms have weight Molecules have weight. Food has weight. You put that food in your body, your body absorbs that. You will have more atoms in your body. When you lose weight, where does it go? Do you burn it off as heat? No, because those aren't atoms. That's energy. You're breathing out CO2. You're releasing different sorts of atoms. You are losing atoms. That's how you physically get smaller, right? And so when you are, um, when you're eating, you know, meat, you're eating fat, you're eating protein, you're eating calories. You can think of it as, you know, think about, you know, fat is, has a lot of calories and oh my God, that's very calorically dense. That's bad because more calories equals more weight. But is that true? Because there's more calories in less weight in fat. It actually takes more weight of protein and carbs to get the same amount of calories. So thinking about it as calories per gram as opposed to you know get grams per calorie is, is a very different dynamic, right? And so if you're having nine calories per gram, oh my God, that's too many calories. Well, what about you know one gram per nine calories as opposed to fat and protein is 2.2 grams per nine gram for nine calories. And you have to eat twice as much weight to get the same calories. So that's, that's an inefficient energy source. So if you eat more of your energy, if you get more of your energy, just from a calories in calories out perspective, if you get more of your energy from fat, as you do from carbohydrates or protein, you will bring in less weight into your body and you will weigh less, right? With the same amount of energy coming in, right? So also, the whole calories in, calories out thing, again, is dumb because there are a lot of things. I mean, you know, omega threes, omega sixes, these are fats. They should have nine calories per gram or one gram per nine calories. And yet you don't use them as energy. You use them as building materials and structural components and, and precursors to other chemicals and, and uh, you know, inflammatory inflammasomes and things like that in your body. You know, that's what they get used for. They don't necessarily get used as energy at all. Proteins don't get necessarily used as energy at all. They're used as building blocks and material. Cholesterol is used as building blocks and material. It's not used as energy necessarily. Cat, you know, carbs can be, right? Because you don't use them really for anything else, but you don't need to eat carbs in the first place, right? And there are a lot of different kinds of carbs, not just carbs, protein, fat. These are individual molecules. There are dozens of individual carbohydrates that each have unique individual complex or uh, chemical interactions in your body. They're complex organic compounds. They have complex um, chemical interactions in your body. Each one of those carbohydrates has a different chemical interaction in your body. They each have different hormonal effects in your body. The carbohydrates you eat will raise your insulin. Fructose will raise insulin. It also blocks leptin. 
and upregulates ghrelin, changing your hunger dynamics, making you more hungry, making you eat more, right? It's also a drug, as we discussed earlier. So these things have very different effects on your body. Even the different carbohydrates that have the exact same amount of calories have different effects on your body. And when you raise insulin, you raise blood sugar. This is toxic. Your body tries to detoxify this, raises your insulin. Insulin is the, the fat storage hormone, the fat storage hormone. Without insulin, you cannot store fat. Type 1 diabetics, they lose the ability to make uh, insulin. They cannot put on fat. They waste away till nothing and then they die unless they get insulin. And then you have people that have an insulin secreting tumor called an insulinoma. And they get massively obese very quickly. Okay. This is hormonally driven. You know, fat deposition is, is purely driven by hormones such as, as insulin, right? Really, really just only insulin. So that's on carbohydrates. And these different sorts of carbohydrates have different effects on those hormones and other hormones. They, they affect your growth hormone. They, they, they reduce the secretion and action of growth hormone. They block the conversion of testosterone into estrogen in women, giving them PCOS. A high, too high testosterone, too low estrogen could resolve, result in PCOS. Suppresses testosterone in men. So these things have massive, massive effects on your body. And all we're, we're worried about is the calories that they bring to the table. I mean, that's, that's ridiculous. I mean, that's absurd on its face. Same thing goes with the dozens of different amino acids and the dozens of different fatty acids. They all have different chemical reactions in your body. They all have different hormonal reactions in your body and actions in your body. Carnitine is, a, is an amino acid. That is all the, that that matters is that it has, you know, four grams uh, or four calories per gram or 2.2 grams per calorie? Or is this an integral component in your life that you have to have or you die as integral co component to the structural and structure and function of your mitochondria? And without it, you can't develop proper neurons and you develop autism and other sorts of uh, developmental delays. Or is it just about the calories? So the thing is you can, you can starve yourself into a smaller pant size or a smaller dress size. You can do that. You know, I mean, they, they did it in Auschwitz. It happened, you know, that's true. But is that the healthiest thing for you? Is that the thing that, that is going to provide you the most health? Is that the thing that's going to provide you long-term health? Because the thing is, if you chronically under eat, you chronically give your body less than it needs, you are actually going to suppress your metabolism. You have less coming in, less is going to go out. Your body's very physically responsible. It, you're, you're not, you're not, you're not telling your body like I'm. I'm. I want to get into a smaller clothes, so I'm just going to eat less, and this is what's going to do. Your body just thinks that you aren't eating as much. It's telling you to eat. You're not eating. That's because it assumes that you don't have access to it. What animal in the wild, when have when they have access to their optimal nutrition, and they're hungry, doesn't eat it? They just go. Actually, you know, I'm going to diet this week. I'm not going to do that. None of them do that. You know, if a panther comes by, you know, some meat and they're hungry, they're going to eat it. If a panda comes by some bamboo and they're hungry, they're going to eat it, right? Same with every other animal on earth. So your body, that's how your biology works. It assumes that if you have access to it, you're going to eat it. If you don't, it's because you don't have access to it. That's your metabolism is going to go down. So it's like if you get your, your hours cut at work, the last thing you want to do is start blowing out the credit card debt, right? And so... You're going to trim sales. You're going to lower your costs so that you can live within your means. That's what your body is doing as well. And then if it's going on long enough and, you, and you're just like, wow, that was horrible. I don't want to do that again. I don't want to go through that again. Even if you get a promotion, you get a, another job, you get a, your, your money starts coming in. You know, most people are not just going to go out and buy a new car and say, oh, yeah, I can just spend and spend and spend now. They're like, that really sucked. I didn't like that. I'm going to still live under, you know, under this threshold and I'm going to save. I'm going to put this away. I'm going to have a rainy day fund because I don't want to go through that again. And I need to protect myself. I need to protect my family. Your body's doing that too. And what the bank is in your body is your fat stores. So you drop your metabolism down. And then when you stop doing that, first of all, you, you hit a plateau, right? Because you start losing weight, but then your body goes, no, nope, we're not going to put this out there. So you actually plateau and you stop losing weight. And in fact, sometimes you actually start putting on weight. I have, I've had multiple patients tell me this all the time that they're trying to diet, they're trying to starve themselves. They don't eat, literally, one guy yesterday told me that he didn't eat for three days in a row, and then he ate sort of very little, and he actually started, he, he lost weight for a while, then it plateaued, and he actually started putting on weight by not eating for three days in a row, 
right? So he's destroyed his metabolism. He slowed it down. And as soon as he does eat anything, the body's just like, yep, no, no, we're getting in the fat because we're in a famine and we need to survive. And that's how you survive famines. And that's why people yo-yo diet. They go up and down. They, they lose some weight. They plateau. They get frustrated. They go back to eating the way they were and bam, they, they gain more weight than they lost. Just like Ozempic, people after two years on Ozempic end up regaining more weight than they lost. So this is just, this is just shocking to me that people you know, went in for that bargain. You know, they, they sacrificed their health for a short term weight loss that is, that is going to be worse at the end of it. So yes, you can lose weight. Yes, you can do that. Is it the best way to do it? Is it going to be the best thing for your metabolism? No, it's not. You know, the thing with a carnivore diet is I tell people, I want you to eat more because I want to encourage your metabolism to, to, to grow and develop. I want to boost your metabolism up and you eat as much as your body wants and needs. And then your body goes, Hey, look, we're flush. We don't need to worry about this. We've got, we've got enough savings in the bank. That's a really cool Ferrari. Like let's, let's go, let's go have it, have some fun. Right. So it, you know, it allows you to tap into your fat stores and raises your metabolism so that you get more consistent fat loss, not weight loss, because you can lose weight by starving yourself, but you lose fat, but you also lose muscle and bone. And that's been shown conclusively in, in body composition studies with people doing these sorts of uh, calorie restrictive diets. Whereas when people do ketogenic carnivore diets, they lose similar amount of weight, but they lose more fat and they put on muscle and bone, right? So much better. It's much more healthy for you and you improve your metabolism. And so long-term, this is a much more sustainable effort because you're not destroying your metabolism. You're actually encouraging your metabolism. You don't hit a plateau. You don't hit a hit a point where you you stall. You just keep losing fat. You keep losing fat. You're putting on uh, muscle and healthy tissue. And then you get to a point of stability. And your body says, yep, that's where we're going to stop now. And uh, your appetite will literally double overnight. And I, I, I noticed this one day, just one, I was eating just these big ribeye steaks. One, every you know, one a day was, was perfect for me. And there was one day I'm like, I needed two. It was just, it was just that quick. You know, that's when I got down to like, you know, five, 6% body fat. And my body was just like, yep, that's where we're staying. And, um, you know, now you have to bring in all this, this energy because we're not going to use our fat stores right now. We have to keep this for the rainy day fund. So that is unfortunately, a, uh, an involved question <laughs> to answer, <laughs> but, um, but I, I, you know, I believe it, it, it deserves, it, it deserves a proper look because that whole idea of calories in calories out is nonsensical. And, you know, Lane Norton suggesting, and I, I mean, I haven't seen him say this, I'm taking your word for it, that he says all the benefits come from, from weight loss. Well, there's some benefits do come from weight loss, but, you know, Carrie, you can attest this, that your, your sleep apnea went away in, in week one before any weight loss happened. Mm -hmm. So in fact, a lot of people, and, and, you know, I mean, rheumatoid arthritis is, is, is according to weight, you know, people who lose weight, lose rheumatoid arthritis, skinny people don't get RA, they, they don't get Crohn's disease. I mean, that's, that's ridiculous. So these medical issues are completely resolving and it's not a result of, of weight loss and exclusion. Obviously, you know, this, you're putting less stress on your system, but no, that, that's, uh, that's not the case that it's only weight loss that's improving their health. It's Lane is, is, um, an ass in a lot of ways. He's, he's just a complete bully and a, and a jerk in a lot of ways. I've tried talking to him civilly. He's a, he's just not having it. He just wants to be a complete ass all the time. That's fine. He can do that. You know, let's see him try to do that to my face. I'd, I'd actually welcome that, you know, and, um, you know, I saw him at a, at a different conference. I went up to him. I tried to be friendly to him and he certainly didn't try any of that crap in my face. So that's interesting. But then, then he was a complete asshole online again, as soon as, as, uh, as we were gone from there, let's, let's see what happens next time. I'd like it to have a more convivial collegial, uh, relationship with him and everybody else. But at the moment, he's just a bit antagonistic to this entire way of thinking just because it, it goes counter to everything he knows and, and thinks he knows anyway, because he's a PhD and by gum, that's the only, that's the only information, uh, in the world that matters. And, uh, he's wrong. He's clearly wrong. And he's trying to stick to his ideology and, and, and think that, and, and try to reassure himself that the things he learned during his PhD weren't completely full of shit, but unfortunately they were. And, you know, as, as long as he continues doing this, so is he. So that's all there is to it. But, uh, yeah, the, the Seco thing is, is nonsense at best as on its face. I mean, it's just, it's just complete, uh, tripe. All right. Charles Bernard, uh, 
1399 super sticker. Thank you. And then we have one from Triple Three Jim. I just realized that we're getting a two hour consultation with the world famous neurosurgeon. Thank yeah. you both for all you do. Yeah, 100%. Actually, it's been way over two hours now. I want to be respectful of your time, Dr. Chafee. The super chats just keep trickling in. I don't think you're going to be here all night. Should we maybe wrap it up on that one or? Uh, yeah, probably, probably a good idea. Um, I, and I'm not, not, I'm certainly not a world famous neurosurgeon. I'm not even a neurosurgeon yet. I'm still in my training. So, um, but, uh, hopefully, you know, this sort of stuff can, can help people, um, live a better life. Yeah, absolutely. Changing lives for sure. I, I, I want to really thank you, Dr. Chafee for doing this. I, I appreciate it. And again, anyone that's watching from my channel, you're, you're already watching Dr. Chafee. You got to be, but if you're not, go subscribe. The link to his channel is below. Your channel has been doing awesome too lately, Dr. Chafee, by the oh, way. Thanks. You got putting more and more content out, really good stuff. So I appreciate everything thank you're you. doing. Like I said, I never would have started Carnivore. It's completely changed my life forever. I never would have started if it wasn't for good doctors like you. I saw the other individuals, but I'm like, those guys are crazy. But to, to hear the science and the truth and the facts, it's changed my life. And I know it's changing so many other people's lives that uh, watch your channel and, and listen to uh, to what you have to say. So thank you so much. Yeah, well, thank you very much. And thank you for having me. Thank you, everyone, for, for coming on. I really like doing these. It's always, it's always a pleasure uh, to do this with you, Carrie, because it's just, yeah, like your, your zest for life and your zest for this sort of thing is, is, is very apparent. And uh, it's just great to see, you know, more and more people getting excited about this and getting this out to people because it's, um, you know, it's it's just, I've, I've, I've never seen anything uh, more important for people's health and more powerful for healing people's life and their health and my own life and my family's life and my patient's life. It's absolutely incredible. And I just, I really want the rest of the world to at least know about it, to have, have at least tried it and at least see if it's something that they want to include in their life because, you know, it could, it can really change their life. And so hopefully, hopefully we can keep doing that. Absolutely. Change your lives, change the world for sure. Thank you, Dr. Chafee. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. All the great questions. Really appreciate it. Have a great day, everyone. Bye. Thanks.